All right. That's right. Thank you very much for joining Murphy's Medicine. Why? Because when Murphy's Law strikes, there's only one treatment, one treatment, and that is Murphy's Medicine. That's right. So thanks for joining us today for our, our dose of Murphy's Medicine. I'm here with a friend, a, a, um, a mentor, a, a touch point in my life, uh, Keith McPherson. So if you guys don't know Keith, uh, you're missing out. Keith is on WFAN, but it didn't just magically happen that way. He's on television. He's on radio. He, he put a lot of hours in with a really serious Mamba mentality. And so I'm bringing him on today to talk about the science of sport, right? We're going to talk about sports. He, he is um, not only just a fan, but an amazing analyst. And he has the spirit and heart of the community of all of, of us out there. All, and all of us are fans in one shape or another. And Keith's um, insights into the Nets, into the Yankees, into the... Um, into the ethic of sport is amazing because not only was he a college athlete, but he was also a, um, a scholar of communications, of explaining the sport and understanding things. And so I'm really looking forward to Keith. Thank you so much for joining the show, Keith McPherson. Um, I really appreciate you coming on. What's up, Doc? Thanks for the nice <laughs> intro, the kind words. Queuing me up, making me seem greater than I am. <laughs> no, we Appreciate call it, it. self-edification in the business, right? I mean, I want to edify you because you are the freaking man. I've learned so much from you, and I, I wouldn't have started this podcast or this journey with my YouTube channel w without you. So um, first off, I, I just got a quick question to ask. Uh, when did it start? When did, when did you start all of this? How did you become the the right i it's like um uh, what's that wrestling the arm wrestling movie i oh, turned a man to machine right and arnold <laughs> um, and um uh, so much slant, slant, turns a hat back for his arm wrestling thing when did you how when did this all start when when did your when did your fandom begin i guess for um for sport Wait, let's start there a long long time ago uh, in a land before time no i just uh you know I, I grew up as a little guy uh, without anyone telling me who I had to root for. I grew up without my father in the household. And I think that, you know, as I've gotten older, I realized when you don't have your dad around, you look for that male figure or the guy you want to grow up and be through TV and through sports and through video games and comic books. Like, I was the type of kid, thank God I have my older brother, Sean. He was 10 years older than me. I didn't really realize that, I, like, when I was young, like, everybody had their dad around. Like, my brother being 10 years older than me was, like, my father figure. And uh, I didn't really feel like I was lacking, but my brother, Sean, he never was really, like, into sports, but he collected uh, trading cards he had every um, NFL NBA baseball like all the best players and I just remember being young and like he had his crap pile of cards that I could go through <laughs> and this is like four or five and then by the time I'm four or five I'm talking I'm walking I can watch TV and I'm just drawn to sports and my mom claims that you know when my dad was around all he did was watch sports so maybe when I was in the womb and, you know, a little kid, my parents got divorced got when I was, like, two or three. Maybe that was there. So I'll give my dad props for that. But, like, I just remember being young and wanting to be a football player, a baseball player, a basketball player, or be Wolverine or Batman or, uh, you, you know, see my Super arm Mario. hair here, right? <laughs> I, I got the Wolverine arm hair, right? You love that. Super Mario, really? You big yeah, Super Mario loved, fan? Yeah, loved, loved uh, playing you know video games with my brother when I was young. Super Mario uh, on on Super Nintendo, and then when N sixty four came out, the game changed. But you know what it was too? Going to school in first grade, kindergarten, you start talking to kids at that young age. Who are you a fan of? You a Yankee yeah. fan? Yeah, of course I'm a Yankee fan. Yankees are winning the World Series, <laughs> and then you you have these starter jackets and these ball caps and. Uh, you know, 
you're in, you're in recess and everybody's representing the team that they like or root for. A lot of these kids are born into Jets fandom or Mets fandom because yeah. their dads put them in there. Me, yeah, I got to got choose. It. So being a front runner and being in the early 90s as a oh. kid, and I say front runner, but as a kid, you can't be a front runner, really. You're a kid. The Yankees yeah. were winning. The Cowboys were winning. So those were the first two teams that I latched on to. They were Americana. They were pop culture. They were in commercials. Uh, the it. Yankees were on Seinfeld. You know, Emmett Smith, Troy Aikman, these guys are on TV. I became a fan of the Yankees and the Cowboys, and then I started playing sports at a young age. And uh, that's really where it started for me, around four or five years old, nice. early 90s, um, just getting into sports and, and looking up to athletes looking up to these guys and thinking hey maybe one day i could grow up and be like them you know I, i'll tell you what what's amazing about it and, and watching you kind of develop is you picked your colors right i mean if you really think about it cowboys <laughs> colors yankees colors blue and white really yeah i i mean we're i so i i say that because i'm a penn state fan right so i i i went to penn state and so i just just it's nice to see that color scheme kind of continue Love down Penn the road. State, man. I yeah, went dude. to Monmouth University, which are like their same colors, blue and white. Yeah. And Coach Callahan like modeled a lot of his things, even the uniforms after Penn State. I wasn't good enough to go to Penn State, but I got invited to the Nike Combine and I oh, went no to Happy way. Valley. Yeah, that was a great oh. experience. Like LaShawn McCoy was there, Joe Hayden, Myron Roll. Dude couple other like top guys that made it to the yeah. NFL and actually my teammate Louis Iliadis uh he, mm -hmm. he played tackle for me he went to Penn State so I got to go oh, there nice. and and see how they rolled out the red carpet for him and I was oh. like man this school is nuts like I'll never forget riding into Penn State there's like farms and then yeah, there's you know, nothing it, yeah <laughs> right. then it pops up and it's like okay we're here now like I right. I, I recognize this from TV and it's it's yeah. crazy. You just see we are Penn State, and uh, that yeah. stadium is ridiculous. They let us go see the field, and I was just like, man, I'm not good enough to play here. But uh, you know, I always it's respected awesome. Penn State. I remember we had these decals of like Penn State, Notre Dame that my mom let me put on on my window when I was a kid, and so just that Penn State logo is such a clean oh, logo awesome. of the nitty line. Totally, I think everybody yeah, respects that line. look. You can't argue with a line, and they just had a. A really good win over Utah, where the rest of the Big Ten kind of flubbed a little bit, and a lot of that I'm gonna—I'll tell you—I'll I'll give to—I'll um, give props to James Franklin, right, and his mm -hmm. job of recruiting young athletes. You know, just like you said, is a fandom. So I was born in New Haven, Connecticut, and then my mom and dad split when I was very young, and for a while my mom was a single mom. You know, me and my brother popping around, you know, going to grandpa's house or granddad's house or, or whatever. And he was always a Yankee fan listening on the radio. And so I would listen as a kid to Phil Rizzuto on the radio with my granddad and eat meatball pizza. Right. I, it's like that a crazy thing as a kid. Right. I think you just you lock into it and. It's sad because my kids totally rebel. They just, you know, my youngest is like, we're Don't watching. Do you care about baseball? Oh no, <laughs> at all, right? So, so I've got five of them, right? Uh, um, uh, girl, boy, girl, girl, boy, right? And so, man, I tell you what, the the youngest boy, he's gonna be a big dude, but his, um, I said, come on, let's watch Penn State football. It's Rose Bowl. He said. Dad, football is disgusting. <laughs> He's right. <laughs> it's disgusting. And it's like he took a dad. Could you imagine? It's like saying, well, I'll tell you, one of my other kids said, like, I hope the Yankees don't win. It's like stick a dagger in my eye. Like, you just you couldn't hurt me any more than that, you know? <laughs> <It's> like, who <laughs> raised you guys? <laughs> right. What is wrong here? How has this happened? So – so it's important that you kind of understand that's your passion, right? I mean, so you, first off, you're, you're a football player in your own right, um, very successful playing collegiate football. And let's face it, not everyone gets there. I, I finished, I told you, I went to Penn State. I finished football in my senior year 
at our divisional ch- district championships to head towards the state game. And I was a cornerback and I encountered a running back who um, I'd already known on the racetrack because we were sprinters. But, and he was a big dude. And I'm like, wow, how's this big dude move so fast? <laughs> and then you put pads on him and you recognize you can't tackle him, right? And when you if that happens, you're like, yeah, the game's done. Have a nice day. But that was my end. And it's full of tears, right? I mean, and it, it's it's emotional because it is passion. So you become a collegiate athlete. How did you get there? How did you get to – because you were a quarterback in high school, right? I thought you were a quarterback, right? So you end up a wide receiver. How, do you, how did you get there? How, how did you get from high school so... to college? So I told you, like, when I was, like, five years old, I, you know, started watching the sports, and then we started playing ball outside as kids. And then by the time I was, I think, 10 years old, I was able to play Pop Warner. But I was always, like, frail, bone, skinny. Like, I remember the first year I t- tried to show up and play. I think I was 55 pounds, and the oh weight, the weight, like, floor, the lowest you could be was 60 pounds. <laughs> I remember crying like a baby, but then I, I ended up playing fall baseball that year, I think, when I was nine. And that was a good experience. But football, so baseball was my first love because football, football shunned me because I was too small. So, I, yeah. you know, I was I was jaded by that. And uh, I really fell in love with baseball around, you know, ages uh, eight, nine. That's when I started playing Little League. But football, I just was naturally gifted at whether and, and it didn't matter whose neighborhood in my town we went to play. It didn't matter if we were playing um, across town. Like I just I, I could run. I could throw. Football just came naturally to me, yep. and so I started to like football more. And my first year I played, I don't think they knew what to do with me. I was playing defensive end, tight end. <laughs> well, you've uh, got a wingspan, right? Let, let's face yeah, it. Yeah, I think I was a little you taller. You have a than, good wingspan. I was a little taller than some of the kids, and I remember, you know, like getting after um, the running back, quarterback from the opposite end, being able to run uh, guys down. But then my, my second year um, – I had a coach that just had a few different athletes on the team that were yeah. already in their positions, and I was kind of an unknown. And he's like, you're going to play quarterback. And uh, I told this story recently on WFAN. I, I came home sad from practice that day, like upset. Like My brother was like, how was practice? I was like, sucked. And he's like, why? What's wrong? I'm like, they, they made me practice as a quarterback. They want me to be the quarterback. Like, I want to play wide receiver. I want to play running back. I don't want to be the quarterback. Everybody's going to be looking at me. I'm scared. Like, I'm going to make a mistake. Everybody's going to laugh at me. I'm going to be embarrassed. My brother's like, are you crazy? They're going to make you the quarterback? Like, we're lit. (laughs) You're going to get the cheerleader. Yeah, like, let's go, bro. He's like, I didn't think you were going to come home and say that. So then my brother (laughs) buys me a football. And uh, this is my, like, age 11 season. My brother buys me a college-sized football. We're playing with, oh, like, wow. a little peewee ball, but it was smart of my brother to do that because right. I started throwing a college-sized ball, and by the time I was, like, 15, a freshman, bro didn't want to catch the ball with me anymore because I was firing yeah. it at him. Uh, right. <laughs> and then I became varsity quarterback my sophomore year, and wow. I played three years of varsity in Ocean Township, and what I could tell you is, man, I used to ride my bike from my apartment all the way across town to our high school and just train by myself. I'll run the bleachers. Uh, football was a sport that I didn't need anyone to help me with. I didn't need my brother. I didn't need my dad. I could, you know, set up cones and set up a ladder and run drills. I could I could literally throw the ball on air. Or I, I had a bush in my front yard that I used to just yeah. drop back and throw the ball into the bush, go get the ball. And, you know, shout out to Ocean Township, Big Red Country, a lot of people's dads. That's awesome saw my talent and would come pick me up and try and get me to work out with their kids and motivate their kids. And I just always had drive. I just always had work ethic because I knew, I remember I had a doctor, uh, Dr. Sasson, you know, he's giving me my physical and he's checking me out when I'm like 16 years old and the talk of the town, the sophomore quarterback starting varsity. And he's telling me, he's like, you're not going to be, that big like you're not gonna be 6'4 220 NFL quarterback right he's like start thinking about college and using football as a vehicle to get there right like wow you're you can get a scholarship 
from what I'm hearing, you're you know you've got colleges coming to watch the games and stuff. You you can be a scholarship athlete, but you know making it to the NFL is tough. And he's like, I'm not trying to discourage you. I'm just letting you know, right. like, don't let the NFL be your end all be all. You know, I could tell you're a young guy that doesn't come from much, and you know now you're in the newspaper and the team's uh, pretty good and people starting to tell you things. And I'm glad he planted that seed with me um, because then when I did get, you know, scholarship offers, I had about 10, 15 scholarship offers. Um, I kind of went to school knowing like, hey, uh, it's tough to make it in the NFL. I'm not the biggest guy. I'm not the fastest guy. I'm good. But like I need to get an education and I need to know what I want to do next. And I went in undeclared. But that's when I started figuring out that I wanted to major in communication, radio, and television. So you you asked yeah. about me playing quarterback. We yeah. won the state championship my senior year. I was Whoa. Uh, like the third, that's third awesome. ranked third ranked quarterback in the state. I went to the Governor's Bowl, New York versus New Jersey All Star Game. Wow. Outplayed all the quarterbacks in the game, and uh, I went to James Madison University. And James Madison had just won the national championship. So to me, yeah. I was looking at them as like the USC of like one AA or right. FCS. It used to be one AA. Yeah. It's FCS now. Right. And it was the furthest scholarship I had from New Jersey is going to Harrisonburg, Virginia. Wow. And I just wanted to get far away from home to experience what it was like. And sure. uh, I went there and played quarterback for two seasons. Uh, didn't really like it that much. Transferred what to did? Monmouth University. And when I transferred to Monmouth University, I just wanted to come back home. And I knew yep. that they had WMCX 88.9 FM on campus, a radio station on campus. Oh. And then they had Hawk TV, a TV station on campus, like a, like a college one. But, like, right. for me, I knew they didn't have exactly that in Virginia. And I also knew, like, I just I – don't, I don't know. I just had this in my head. I'm like, if you get a, a degree out here, where are you going to go work in Richmond, Virginia? or <laughs> Right. Newport News or something. I'm like, nah. I want to be. They, they don't cover the Yankees there. That's t- exactly. right, Tidewater I, area. You're gonna, you gotta deal with the Mets. <laughs> no, I want to be in New York. So I knew Mammoth. Mammoth's main thing was like, you know, we're an hour south of New York City and one mile from the yeah. beach. So Mammoth started offering scholarships. I, I was able to get a scholarship at Mammoth, and I came in and told them, hey, I'm not trying to come here and be your starting quarterback. I was third string quarterback at JMU. Right. I had to sit out a year. This is before the transfer portal started. Yeah, because well, you're you're like, a skinny guy, right? I mean, you're you're big, but you're you know. So I, did I they like put weight on you? One eighty five. Yeah, yeah. Oh I was like God. six one, six two, one eighty, one ninety in the in the uh, press guide. But uh, I said, you know, I'll come yeah. in. I'll do what you guys want me to do. I'll return kicks, yep. punts, play receiver, safety, whatever. whatever it is. Like you know, practice squad. Like the first year, I was sitting out anyway. So if you need an athlete, a body, like. I got you, and I, and I went and, and I did that, um, but I knew pretty quickly, like, you know, I wasn't gonna. Sounds I knew like I wasn't that. gonna break through. The first year I had to sit out, the second yep. year, and now like it's you know this is great. Podcasting is great because it makes you like dig yeah. back into like what happened. Rest in peace to my brother. On my twenty first birthday, we went out partying, and him and I ended up wrestling, and he uh, locked up with me. It got the yeah. best of me, and I took a step back off the curb and broke my foot in May of uh, 2009. And that was going into the season that I probably had the best shot to start at, like a slot wide receiver. And right. that changed my entire summer. I couldn't run. Wow. I couldn't couldn't work out the same. So I went into camp hurt. I went into camp yeah. not ready to go. And, uh, you know, after that season, I had one more season and I ended up giving my scholarship back my fifth year. And I just yeah, said, wow. listen, I'm, you know, I'm not going to yeah. crack the starting lineup. It is a lot to be a student athlete. And then also I was a DJ. So I'm DJing <laughs> in the bars. I'm DJing in the yeah. parties at night. That's awesome. Uh, <laughs> oh my God. It just, I just had a lot right. going on and something I had to give. And I knew I wasn't making the NFL. I played with guys like uh, Chris Hogan. Um, he yeah. came to Monmouth from Penn State. There's another yeah, uh, you got it. There's another tie, and, and there I were a lot of with, people that ran between there, Keith. You know, and, yeah, Monmouth and, and Penn State. Yeah, they poach kids. Penn State poaches kids from New Jersey all the time, and especially Monmouth. Like, sure, just very common. Uh, Eric McCoo. Um, yep, you got it. Coming I out actually, of Red Bank, I, that dude, big dude. Like I knew Eric, um, and it wasn't so much that he was, he wasn't big this way, but he was two men. Yeah. Right, he his width. He's a was sturdy guy. Men. He he was a, yeah. a beast running the ball. 
Yeah, no uh, doubt. Yeah, so, you know, that's my college story. Uh, you know, thank God that I just kind of followed my gut always, and I had this overarching feeling. You know, I played with guys that I knew. Uh, they, you know, they weren't that smart. They didn't speak that well. Right. Like, they had – it was football <laughs> or nothing. They had no real other options. Right. I knew very early, oh, I have other options. Um, and I always loved other sports. I wasn't just a right. football guy. Like, I love basketball. I love baseball. And I'm able to yeah, speak I about did, it, I talk didn't about get it. Into, I didn't get into a little bit of that. Did, did, so did you play baseball in college too or no? No. So I played baseball, and I wish I played longer. Uh, my next-door neighbor yeah. ended up going to University of Virginia, and I remember uh, oh, wow. his dad, they used to always be at the field or going to the cages or going to drill yeah. or just work on stuff. And his dad, you know, would tell me, hey, man, you could be a pretty good center fielder. You should come with us. I went to practice, practice with them one time. You do? You look he's like a, a center fielder, hitting, man. I could I mean I I did play center field. I wanted to be Bernie man. Um yeah. I played center field from age like 8 to 12 and then once we got to from little league to Babe Ruth league, I was out of my league, but I just had yeah. a lot going on too. At 13, I was playing Babe Ruth baseball, AAU basketball, running track for my middle school all in one spring and yeah. I got Osgood Schlatter's disease in oh, my yeah. knee. That's when I hit yep. my first real growth spurt. My knees lumped up, both of them. Yep. We're doing Big research on this. We go see a doctor, and the doctor's like, you got to shut it down. Like, you're doing too yep. much. And uh, yep. in my town already, I had been playing quarterback 11, 12. Yep. Um, they're like, hey, we need you to be ready by August for training camp. So I stopped playing in, in, in May and in, in June, and I rested all you know June and, and July so that I'd be ready for football, and then I played, and I was fine. But, yeah, that was painful. My knees were, like, tender, um, and I was just doing too much. Yeah, I was playing too many sports, but I played everything. I played baseball. I played basketball. I played football. I ran track. In high school, I was varsity track and, and varsity football and just lifted weights in the winter. Probably could have yeah, wrestled or played football, but, like I said, I was skinny, so my coaches were on me right away, like, hey, you got to lift. You got you to gotta work yeah. out in the winter time and, and bulk up and I did go from like 155 my freshman year to like 170 my sophomore year and then by the time I graduated I was like 185 so all of that we, we kind of got what looks like a blessed sort of life through it but during that time can you think of at least one episode where something was it seemed insurmountable that you were able to overcome oh man all the time um so I mean, at which point? Like, we can go through high school or college or, you know. Yeah, well, um, let's let's chew through. Well, you know, yeah, high school seemed like the whole thing through it was, was pretty formative to you. But, yeah, tell, tell me about that. From grade school through high school, what what was the big, the big obstacle for you? I mean, just, you know, I grew up in Ocean Township, 88% white school. Um, one of the only black kids that's in every circle. I'm quarterback. Um, right. uh, you know, I'm at every party. I know everybody. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I started getting arrested when I was 13. I got an arson charge when I was 13, just being a stupid kid, burning up, right. you know, fireworks and, uh, you know, dittos in the woods. Uh, and yeah. then when I even got into high school, I got an assault charge at 16. Some guys jumped my friend. My friend calls me. To yep. come to his aid and his defense. Next thing you know, we're in a store fighting and on camera. Uh, you know, <sighs> a lot of things like like that. Uh, a big story that happened when I was a senior. Uh, some friends I was with stole some Halloween candy. And I'm driving and they jump in my car. Oh, what's up? What are you guys doing? They're like, oh, we just jacked those kids for their candy. Right. Not thinking anything of it. Someone files a police report of it. Um, and my name comes up in it. They tagged me Small as oh Keith, Keith McPherson's the getaway driver. I used to drive this uh, <laughs> like 1997 <laughs> GMC Jimmy. And That's it. Our uh, our football helmets. I have it up there, but I can't get it down. It's set up. Our football helmets had an O yeah. on it, and so I took two O's and I put them together to make an eight, and that was yep. on my back windshield. So like everyone in town knew it was me, and I had knew like loud subwoofers. Uh, oh, so I'm next sure thing I did. know, I, I'm in school. And I'm in lunch, and my coach pulls me out of lunch, and he's pissed. 
He's yeah. like, what the hell were you guys doing last night? I was like, what? And he's like, what the hell were you doing last night? You were robbing people? And I'm like, oh, we were messing around. I was dressed in all black. I was like, right. I was jump, jumping yeah, out of bushes, course. scaring people. Mr. But I didn't, mischief. Yeah, we were, yeah, it was mischief night for me, but yeah. I wasn't robbing anybody. I didn't steal anything. Right. And then, you know, we found out that uh, charge was pressed because one of the kids had a cell phone in his uh, in his candy bag, whatever. So what that did. See, I know, don't envy that. I don't, honestly, I don't envy that at all. Be, yeah. I, I'll tell you why. It is harder for kids, and, and this is just the separation between us age-wise, right? Um, when we did that stuff, there were no cameras, Keith. Yeah. And and from being, being the getaway driver versus, like, trying to knock off an ATM machine and now having no cameras, right? Like, you think about the amount of trouble that Gen Xers and, and – boomers got into oh, yeah. that is n- nowhere near it was never documented it was never recorded yeah, it was no never be, it was never able to be sent memory to holes. someone else like hey look at this uh yes and even for me i remember I, I i ended up not having to go to court for this this thing actually went to court it went from like what? petty theft yeah this is what i'm saying i there was you uh, right someone knocked off a lawyer's kid that sounds like what happened there so, uh, from what I remember, you know, and it was two other, uh, two other young black kids in town that played football with me. One was a backup quarterback yeah. punter. One was a linebacker running back and they went hard on them. They were trying to get these kids to actually like be charged. It went from a petty theft report that they were going to throw out right? and someone updated it to a robbery. They said the, like, That's come insane. on. And then with me, uh, you know, my lawyer called in and, and they were like, uh, He's not the getaway driver. Um, they stayed in the same vicinity. Like we stayed in the same neighborhood the rest of the night. There was no, we didn't, yeah. we didn't flee the scene. Uh, right. But what happened was there was this thing called the model agreement in my high school. A model mm-hmm. agreement was between the high school and the police department, where if right. your name comes up in in the police blotter and the like any report, you're immediately entered into this model agreement where for three weeks you're suspended from any type of activities i'm the quarterback of the varsity football team that's on the route to winning a state championship i didn't do anything but now i have to sit for 21 days the town was conflicted because yeah of course (laughs) dads in the town are like hey (laughs) this kid didn't do anything right we need him like we literally need him to win and uh that was a huge thing it was written up in the asbury park press they documented wow. the whole thing, and since my name already had notoriety from scoring touchdowns, being all sure, leading the team, yeah, they led with my name, like Keith McPherson arrested for blah, blah, blah. And I'm just like, I wasn't, right. I literally didn't even go to court or anything, but you know how that type of stuff goes. Yeah. And I hate to say it, it was, it was racism. It was, yeah. you know, I, I feel like th- if this happened to a group of white kids in town, they would have swept it under, ru- under the rug. And I know that because the parents started fighting this to try and like people put a petition together to try and get me out of it but the parents started fighting this to the point where the school actually had to go back and comb through all the records there was a a kid that was shooting um rocks with a slingshot that ended up cracking someone's uh window and he was on our football team but it happened like a couple months ago so then they they Mm -hmm. activated the model agreement on him now he's got to sit out There was another young man on the football team who fell asleep drunk in his car, but the car was running. He got a DUI that night. You bet. But his parents swept that under the rug, handled it. Mm -hmm. They activated the model agreement on him because now people are saying, hey, this isn't right. You guys took, uh, you know, these young guys that were just messing around on Halloween doing what kids do, and you elevated that to a robbery. Now our football team is is, uh, not going to win, right? End of the story, that's, and that's I, no I wish I had the uh, newspaper. I, I sit out yeah. the first two rounds of the playoffs, but in practice, the mm-hmm. defense has to go against me. And in right. practice, I'm a coach so to the good. backup quarterback right. where I'm preparing these guys. I'm like, if you guys right. can stop me in practice, you can stop Brett Brackett, another Penn State tie. Brett Brackett, right. who went to Penn <laughs> State, we played against him and his Lawrenceville yeah. team. And he actually was all state quarterback with me. He was number one. I was three. But I yep. remember in practice being like, if you can stop me, you can stop Brett Brackett. Right. Ocean was That's able awesome. to advance the first two games. 
I came back our Thanksgiving game, which is in between the playoffs, yeah. and then I was right. able to play in the state championship game, ran for a bunch of yards, threw for a bunch of yards, had a couple touchdowns. We won the state championship, and then the whole spread was the story about how they tried to they tried to knock this kid down. They tried to put yeah. this kid out over some nonsense. Yeah. He fought through. He helped his team, right. showed up to practice, prepared the team. I gave a whole speech to the team like, hey, we're not losing. Yep. They're going to think that we are lesser than we are because I'm not there. The rest of you have to step up. My running back, who was my best friend at the time that I actually DJed with, he went off for 256 yards against Brett Brackett's Lawrenceville team when I wasn't wow. playing. I told him, I'm like, it's all you, bro. There's no decoy. Yeah. Like, yeah. you're going to run the ball 30 times in this game. You have to Rich, carry the team. Go. It was all It was all a, a movie. They could honestly have made a, a Friday Night Lights type of movie Dude. off of it. But we end up winning the state championship. And then I go on to take a full scholarship to James Madison. And, and uh, all of that stuff now is, is yeah. so deep in 2005, 2006. Right. It's now just a tale that they tell in town. Uh, about so what's Keith the McPherson lesson? Like what did, football team. What did you learn? Oh, the lesson was, listen, the, there was a few lessons, right? Yeah. The first lesson was like, watch who you're around and what you're doing because somebody else could get you jammed up. I didn't even get out of the car, so I never committed any theft, but I got tagged as a getaway driver, and I didn't leave the little town, Oakhurst, which is where Kenny Pickett grew up. We were literally – like right down the street from Kenny Pickett's yeah. house. I didn't leave the area. I didn't flee the scene. But someone else got me jammed up. Okay. And then I learned that was, you know, I learned about the legal system. I learned about yeah. lawyers. I, like I learned like, you know, more about how these proceedings go. And the next thing was just like, hey, things are going to happen that you can't control. So control what you can control. Take even more control of what you can control. And like I said, I remember we had a team meeting. I stood up in front of the team and I'm like, you guys are going to be without me for the next three weeks. But if you win, I'm going to be back, and we can win the state championship. And I looked, I remember writing out in our group all of the teams and their weaknesses and who I thought we could beat, and I'm like, you can beat them without me. I'm like, right now, everyone thinks that we're done because I'm suspended. But, like, that is like a decoy. That is going to throw some people yeah. off. What I learned then was, like, control what you can control. I went to practice every day, and I, and I balled hard. Where my friends wanted yep. to fight me. Stop running so hard. Stop stop completing passes. Stop right. playing so hard. We got a game this week. And I'm like, I'm telling you, <laughs> if you can stop you me in practice, this. the game is going to be cake. And it was yep. just triumph. It was not letting anything stop you. Um, you know, one of the kids I mentioned that was slinging the rocks with the slingshot, Yeah, they activated the model agreement on him. And so he just quit the team. Yeah. And I remember coming out of Ocean High School one day. And his dad is parked next to my car. And he's like, hey, come come take a ride with me. And I'm like, all right. And so we <laughs> It wasn't go to the a white diner, van or like, anything like that. Was <laughs> nah, and, and I had known his dad. I had, I had met his dad. <laughs> okay, all right, just make it sure. Like, but, yeah. but basically, he was like, Keith, like, you're the guy. And, like, you're like we can already see, like, you're going to come back. You're going to fight through this, whatever. You're taking this all in stride. Everyone in town knows you didn't do anything, but you're wrongfully, like, in all of right. this. My son quit the team. Can you convince him to come back? And I was friends with his right. son, but I knew what type of guy his, his son was. Um, I'm like, I can't convince him of anything, Mike. Yeah. Like, like he, if he, he quit already and he doesn't want to come back, he doesn't believe we're going to win, that's fine. Right. But, like, we're going to win. Like, I'm like, we're, I'm like, this is the closest. Yeah, we're winning. This is the closest we've ever been. This is the best team we've had. We came up short last year. This is my senior year. We're going to win. And then we end up winning. And he didn't get a championship ring. He didn't get a championship jacket because he quit. And uh, quit. I, di I didn't quit. I'm like, well, we'll, we'll go through this. Uh, the 21 days will pass. The season will not yeah. be over. I will return. And as long as my team is alive, they beat Lawrence Town and Brett Brackett. And then they beat yeah. an arch rival the next town over in Wall Township. And oh, it was yeah. like no one thought we could beat Wall. I remember walking off the field with the team in tears. Like, <laughs> like I'm yeah. back, baby. We beat them. <laughs> and like right. everyone thought we, everyone counted us out we able, we were able to beat this team and now i get to come back and play mammoth regional and play um nottingham in the state championship and that was all all they wrote with that yeah i i tell you what i i sport really shapes you doesn't it yeah it, it really yeah. does it it 
it teaches lessons that you may not encounter in other things in life. And, and I feel that it's a nice way to have Murphy's law happen, right? It's a nice way to say crap happens, right? And I got to do something about it. And I have to make a choice as a person, whether I want to persevere or I want to quit. And, um, and I, man, that's just an awesome story, Keith. It's an awesome story. Yeah, so you go. That's not one you'll hear. That's not one you'll hear on the radio or Twitter. It's so far. Dude, back, I'm going to keep that like, nugget right. I, that's come right in the pocket, man. That's where I'm going to keep that story. It, it it says a lot about you, but I think for our listeners to recognize, and they, they, no, you know, no offense to you, right? People who succeed, and and you're succeeding have that same story on different levels because they yeah. chose not to quit, right? They chose not to quit. And they chose to maximize their opportunity even when it was taken from them. And that story with you about going in and coaching and, and doing like a – I played flag football in my med school, right? And we'll, we would – the X's and the O's and you have the whiteboard and you say, here's the strengths, here's the weaknesses, here's all of those guys. By taking you off the field, it actually empowered you to be able to have the time to do that. And some dudes are just going to quit, like like that, you know, that other teammate of yours. Mm -hmm. But man, I think that's a powerful lesson for you downstream too, right? Like the opportunities that you have now, your abilities, um, and your gifts, right? You're very gifted, not just talented, but you're very quick witted. And your analysis skills are great. And so you can see how those were there back then, right? I mean, you were analyzing teams, right? That's what you were doing. Yeah. And you were, it's, it literally is what you're doing. So tell me the next phase, right? So you get through college and what do you do, man? Like, what do you do? Like football's done. College is done. What's next? When I graduated, I was 23 because I transferred a year, and I think I, I didn't do anything, like, uh, for one year. Like, I, I left JMU. You're almost and I as left old as abruptly. Sean Clifford, you know, the 26-year-old quarterback. <laughs> yeah. right Shout out to him. You're almost as old as Cliff. Yeah, so so what happened? So you're 23. You're, you're still a very young man, right? You're still a very young man. Yeah. What do you I end up graduating in the winter, December of 2011, and I'm living with who's now my wife at the time, but her and her two girlfriends in their college house. Uh, I yep. had a little bit of like a falling out with my mom where I was supposed to go home, but, you know, home wasn't really that welcoming. And, um, yep. you know, it's tough when you graduate, uh, especially like my mom never went to school. So they think you're supposed to graduate and have a job and be successful right out the door. And I'm just like, listen, like, it's quiet for me. Nobody's checking for yep. me. I just, you know, graduated with a communication radio degree. Uh, and everywhere I applied is looking for three to five years of experience. Like, everywhere I've applied, I actually haven't heard anything back. Like, <laughs> and I was sending cover letters and resumes. But when you don't have yeah. any experience, like, it, none of that matters. And when you don't have someone putting you on top of – you know, the pile of resumes, I had no leads, no connections, no family in yeah. anything that could do anything. What I had was um, I, I DJed. So like I said, I DJed at school, and I, right. used to, I used to throw all the parties. We had a bar called The Draft House I used to DJ at. We had another bar called Stingers I used to DJ at. We had another bar called, um, I think, Reds that I used to DJ at. I was, I was the man. Like, I'm DJ MC promoter. Um, right. And so I kept that going. So even when I graduated at Monmouth, I'm still DJing some of these parties because, like, I'm living right. with my, my wife and her yeah. friends that are still in college. People, you know, whether they knew or not, I'm still just around. And also, I grew up in Monmouth County. So, like, mm. Monmouth University, like, I'm right. home. Uh, and what I also did when I graduated, and, and, like, I remember trying to apply to so many gigs, I just I, – I started my own, like, DJ group. I called it – allied entertainment and the allied broke down to all in every day and i recruited like <laughs> 10 other djs and promoters right. so and started people a that business just, 
Yeah, so I started my own little DJ business, and that kept me afloat age 23, 24, and then at 25, they opened a guitar center in Ocean Township, uh, Guitar yeah. Center 829. I, I uh, always remember 300 people applied to work at this guitar center, and they picked 30 people, and I was one of those 30 people. You guitar guy? Like, Are you a guitar guy, Keith? I didn't know that. I am a pro audio guy so guitar center nah, has a section there of we go. loudspeakers microphones yeah. uh yeah. scarlet audio interfaces yes. and dj decks pioneer um you know technique turntables i was well versed in that through djing uh-huh. from age 15 to 25 i had spent the last 10 right. years going to clubs and hooking up 10 years you're like an expert you had ten thousand hours worth of audio yeah, I and I. Did you probably didn't even recognize back then? No, right? it, was just like, a, it was a passion. It was a love. It was yeah, something that got it. I picked up when I was in high school. My friend, I told you, who was my running back. His parents yep. bought him DJ equipment when we were freshmen. He needed wow. someone to help. Um, yep. And actually, the kid that was shooting the slingshot, they <laughs> partnered up first, and the, okay. the kid quit on that. Oh, we're never gonna make any money DJing. This All isn't right. gonna be successful. He they split the uh, equipment cost. And then he ended up selling it to the one guy, and he bought the whole equipment. But then he right, brought so me on for free. Business. Like you don't have to, you don't have to put any money up, Keith. Oh my God! What I did, I I used to hustle CDs. I used to burn CDs. I used to go and buy the stack of blank CDs, and then go yep. on Kazaa, LimeWire, BearShare, download yep. music. I'd be in class. A girl passed me a loose leaf paper with fifteen tracks on it. I go home, download right, the tracks, bring her back a CD, yep. five dollars the next day. He knew that I had a stack of CDs. I had all the music, <laughs> and he was yeah. DJing on CDs. He brought me in. Yeah, I, I started DJing parties with him at 15. You know, fast forward 10 years, I'm doing my own thing now. I have my own equipment. I'm working at Guitar right. Center. I'm the leading salesman of JBL speakers in the Northeast. I'm selling like 10 pairs of JBL oh speakers a week because people are coming in. I'm selling them the best quality, the highest right. quality, the most yeah. expensive. I'm killing it. Uh, I was one of the first people to build that guitar center. Like I'm literally like building the shelves and and breaking stuff out and stocking the shelves. Uh, What do you think made you such a good salesman? What do you think made you such a good salesman, Keith? I think I was just real. And to be honest with you, back then I was a heavy drinker. I always felt like I smelled like alcohol in there. (laughs) (laughs) My bosses definitely some days were like, hey, man, like you smell like straight Jack Daniels. But imagine you're a DJ – or a performer, and you come into Guitar Center, right. and to your right, when you first come in, is a pro audio section, and there's a guy like me, smells like he was in the club last night, right. and he's playing with the right. lights, he's dropping beats, and you come in and you ask him for help, and I'm personable. And so yeah. I'm asking you questions. So what do you do? You travel with DJing, or you setting up a, a venue, or whatever? Okay, no, just, like follow me. There's a whole wall of speakers. Like, tell me your price point. Right. Tell me what you're trying to do, and I'll show you. And we can test them. What, what type of music you like? Hip-hop, EDM, country music, rock? All right, we, we can play that. I have it all set yeah. up. I can play the music loud for you. I was telling people, I'm like, and you know what? You're going to need coverage on this. If it rains, if this stuff breaks, if someone damages yep. your stuff at, at the party, you can come right back. I'm like, I was killing it, man. And and what I found was just that I was personable. I was real. People like People, like, came back to the store to kick it with me. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, and you know, people were spending money, and when they were doing the sales and stuff, they're, you know, I was I would show up hungover. I would show up smelling like alcohol, but I would work, and yeah. I would produce. And so my bosses never really said anything to me because they're like, this guy is – he's selling the most stuff. Like, he's, he's, yeah. he's turning the most profit, even though I was making, like, $12 an hour and, like, a small percentage on, e- on every sale. But yeah, yeah. Um, I worked there at 25 for not even a year, and um, this is a good spot to pause for your next question, but uh, yeah. the MLB Fan Cave was doing auditions, and I'm working yep. at Guitar Center, and I sent in a, a little two-minute video, hey, I'm Keith McPherson, I'm a, a DJ on the Jersey Shore, I work at Guitar Center, and I'm a big Yankee fan. And I didn't even know what the Fan Cave was, but a girl from yeah. James Madison University reached out to me and she's like mm. i always see you with a yankee hat I-, I saw you were at a yankee game this year there's this mob fan cave and i work in casting for mtv oh you should submit 
you should apply. Yeah. And I'm like, what's the fan cave? I remember seeing the fan cave on, like, Baseball Tonight and right. a couple other one-off things. But I thought it was, like, a place, like, a public place people could go and buy jerseys and hang out. Right. I, I'm like, apply for what? They're like, they're casting fans to, like, right. experience the fan cave. You would be great to represent the Yankees. Yeah. So I applied. And the rest is no. I <laughs> there's a lot more to there's it than the rest more, is history, that's, right? <laughs> that's where that's where we started to to turn the fire so, up a little more. Like I got out of my yeah. hometown, right? After that exactly. So you you go from a big fish, small pond to way bigger, right? Way bigger. Now at that time, as these kind of you've nuanced through stuff, you figured stuff out on your own with a lot of hustle. Um, you must have had people that taught you. Like, did, did anyone teach you how to do sales and all? Did anyone mentor you? Yeah, so, I mean, we had a we had a whole week of, like, a tutorial. Uh, you had to learn. Like, Guitar Center is pretty legit as far as, like, they sat, they sent someone in from Minnesota to teach us all. We had to learn the point-of-sale system. We had to learn. Yeah. Um, we no, had no, to, no, Keith. You, you... I'm talking about, hi, how are you? What are you here for? Oh, no. How can I help you? No. Where did you learn that? No, they. You had to um, learn that somewhere. Someone must have modeled you how to do this. Yeah? No? No, I would give my mom credit. I give my mom credit for raising me to a standard that was higher than the standard she was raised to and higher than the, the standard she lives to. Like, I was taught to shake yeah. people's hands, look them in the eye, speak clearly. Uh, enunciate, pronounce all your words, and, uh, you know, treat people with respect. Like, that started early. Yeah. And so I think, you know, that is what carried me. No one actually taught me how to sell in there, but my people skills kicked in. Like, yeah. And that's why I said I was real. Like, people can tell if you're if you're just trying to sell them. I, I legit was like, hey, how can I help you? Like, what are you right. trying to do? I'm a DJ myself. I know all of this stuff in here. If you're looking for something, like I can actually point you in that direction and then tell me your price point. We can figure something out. I just was personable, but I, I give my mom credit for how, like my people skills, how that started, like very right. young, you know, even in the house. It's like, look, look at me in the eye when you speak to me. Uh, pronounce your words. Uh, stand up straight. You know, um, like now, th those I'm, now I'm checking my posture. I'm like, I'm totally off. Well, we're sitting. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. It, you know, I have a buddy who pods. He he podcasts and he he does it standing, right? So he'll stand. And sometimes I feel like you get like it's just more clear. Your thoughts get clearer. I when stand. You're um, I'm sitting today, but I stand. This is a stand up desk. I can stand in here, and I stand when I do 95 percent of my WFAN shows. Yeah, no way. That's awesome. Opens up your diaphragm, your breathing, you your lungs, and then also right. you can like like I watched Pat Pat McAfee. I I, yeah. I like saw him standing, and he gets so into it and energetic. Yeah, and that helps me. You know, um, I I feel like I I'm more into it when I'm talking, uh, right. standing up versus sitting down. Nice. So yeah, that's just a little aside. Stand more in life, right? If you want to live longer, stand stand more often. Yeah. Not stand, I worked in a, right, but stand. I worked in an office for like five years where I, eight hours a day I'd be sitting at a desk and I developed like lower back issues. Oh, yeah. And once I, once I discovered a stand-up desk at Fubo, I didn't have too many of those issues. They kicked back in during the pandemic, though. I will say that, yeah. like being stuck in the house, sitting down all day. Then my it's back the flared up. But haven't had any back issues. I stand. I don't, I don't spend – hours at a desk and yeah, the haunch. crunched right. over yeah. yeah that's that's the key so tell me your experience starting at the fan kit because so you apply for this did you start your podcast or do any youtube stuff at that time well, well, tell me about what how this all unfolded so back at that time i think what they noticed as far as like my digital presence and social media i didn't have a podcast i didn't have a youtube channel but right. with Allied Entertainment and the DJ stuff I was doing, right. we promoted every night, every event. They right. could see that I built something online, right? They could see, like, okay, this guy's got a whole DJ profile. Then he's got a whole company right. profile. And they could scroll through that and see, like, he understands how to, you know, uh, use video, use uh, Photoshop, graphics, and, like, get people's attention online. And right. 
I think when I sent my video in, I, again, I was just real, you know. Um, I was in my room, and I said I work at Guitar Center. I'm a DJ. I'm also into fitness, but, like, the Yankees are a part of my life. Like, the Yankees yeah. are appointment television for me. And back then, I wasn't going to as many games. I was just broke, and I was uh, further away yeah, from the sure. stadium. I'm like, I said, I'm like, man, going to the stadium is a treat. Like, I don't get to yeah. go. <laughs> I'm like, I might get to go <laughs> once a year, and it's like a holiday. Uh, it's funny oh how my God. think about changed, how times but... you are. Yeah, that's crazy, right? Now, now, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> how, how many now. games we go to now versus that's why I go when to I was a kid. Games a year now. <laughs> it, it's insane. I, I as a kid, I I never went to Yankee Stadium. I didn't go to Yankee Stadium. I, my I, my Yankee Stadium was in my mind as yeah. I listened to Phil Rizzuto. Yeah. Right, yeah. and then Michael Kay. Right, that that was that was in my mind. No one took me. So I, I took my crazy. dad to his first game. My mom to her first game. My my wife was my girlfriend. She actually brought me to my first game. And yeah, and one of the first That's things awesome. I said, you know how you just said it was in your mind. I remember the first strikeout hearing the. The PC Richardson, and I'm like, yeah, holy! Man. I'm like, I'm inside the TV, and my girl's like, <laughs> I'm, like I'm like, I like now I'm I'm like it it, it broke That's a it. wall for me. I'm like, I've yeah. watched so many Yankees games and just been immersed with my eyes on the TV from right. a kid to a grown man. When I finally got into Yankee Stadium and and heard the sounds and saw everything, I'm like, wow! Like, I can come here and be in like it just broke a wall down for me and. I yeah. became a fiend after that. I remember that was 2011, and I knew I was late. I had wanted to go to the games and stuff. The Yankees had won the World Series in 2009. Then they opened up the new stadium, and I was trying to get there, right. trying to get there. Just didn't have the dollars. And, uh, you know, once I got there, I, I vowed. I was like, I am going to be a part of it. New York, New right. York. I'm like, it's I, I can do this. Like, I can be somebody in this Yankees universe and I spent the next 10 years trying to get in there. Right. Let's, I mean, let's think about that, right? So it's been 10 years, Keith. It's been 10 years. You've been grinding. And, and that's not to mention all the, the backstory of everything you have to understand audio, to understand promoting, yeah. to under, like, like your whole life has built to where you are today mm -hmm. because of intention and passion right when you combine passion with intention you get success yeah you and I, success. I never veered that's something else i tell young people now i never veered too far off the course right i knew i was a music and sports guy i'm a dj right. i work in guitar center like i grew up playing sports i watch sports and i and i i watch i mean i remember my my girl in college she's like you wake up and go to sleep watching sports center and I'm like, yeah, because one day this information yeah. is going to pay off. Like one day right. all of this stuff that I've taken in every day is just going to be built in knowledge that I know about sports. And it's going to it's going to help me be successful. I don't know exactly how, but like one day that's me ta talking to her in 2010, 2011. <laughs> um, right. And, you know, even what does she say about game, it now? What does she say about it now? Do you get to go? We're married See, I now. told you. <laughs> yeah, we're married <laughs> now. And she's had a front row seat to everything the good the bad yeah. the ugly the struggles the wins and what i'll say about my wife is she never doubted people yeah. in my family doubted friends doubted i had people switch up on me people change up on me people look down yeah. on me when i was struggling when i was doing other things my wife just was consistent she just always believed she's smart she she's a recruiter that's her profession so she huh. finds talent so she saw the talent she saw something in me in college uh she helped me in college she drove me to campus. She woke me up on, on days where I needed to get to class or get to the yeah. you know, radio station to host. Um, she drove me to DJ gigs an hour away <laughs> when I didn't have a car. Like, she just knew. She So, yeah. I mean, makes sense. That's a person that you, you marry. That's a person that uh, you continue to build with. Because right. in some of my darkest times, in some of my times where I felt like nobody had me, she was there. And, um, yeah. It's, you know, I met her in college, and here we are in 2023 now, uh, got married in 2021. Um, she's she's my best friend. She is my support system. I don't have too many people that I confide in or that even know as much about me as my wife does. But I always say she, she knew, and she never wavered. She never – when I was working at a restaurant, when I quit jobs, like, you know, I, I, I quit I – quit 
MTV and I quit Rock Nation and I didn't ask. Why'd you her do for that? Permission. Why'd you do that? Why'd well, you do that? Um, I feel like now we're jumping all around and this is why these, these podcasts are interesting. Um, yeah, that's why I do it. So I was in the fan cave in 2014, and when I got out of the fan cave, uh, I had no leads again. So it was kind of like graduating yep. college again. Like, oh, now mm-hmm. I got to find a job. The fan cave was just one season, and that's cool, but, like, it's not a career. Like, we made a lot of money in there, but, like, that money, I remember I left the fan cave with, like, $12,000, and that evaporated in, like, three, four months. <laughs> <Poof>. <laughs> it's Yankees tickets, right? Thanks, Hal. Poof. Yeah, there gone. And uh, yep. so after the fan cave, there was a show at the fan cave every Tuesday called Off the Bat, an MTV2 show. Mm-hmm. And I applied to 100 different jobs. It was about five and a half months from October to February. And I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't land anything. I had a couple calls, but nothing was happening. So I was about to just start working at the Home Depot down the street from my mom's house in Neptune. And mm-hmm. I finally got a, a hit back, and it was from MTV, MTV2, and Brittany Travis. And shout out to Brittany Travis because I've been putting her name out there on these podcasts a lot. She remembered me from the fan cave. My resume had nothing on it besides um, Monmouth University, class of 2011, communication, radio, television, right. MLB fan cave. And in between, it had like Guitar Center, but that doesn't help you get the. <laughs> you never know. You just got to put your sales metrics down there, right? Yeah. I like even put like Allied Entertainment, you know, DJed yeah. and owned my own, mm-hmm. you know, DJ company. But uh, she gave me a shot and she said, she's like, I, I, I remember your energy. She's like, I remember you walking around the fan cave. I remember how you greeted people, how you talked to people, how people right. received you. I'd never talked to her in the fan cave. <laughs> but I remember right. seeing her because she was a social media person. So she would take pictures of us, and she would be around. But then when I finally got into the Viacom building, 1515 Broadway in Times Square, I, I went to two rounds of interviews, and I got the gig. I was hired as a social media coordinator at MTV2. Boom. Don't have to work at Home, um, at home Depot. But now I got to commute from the Jersey Shore two hours to the city every morning. Fine. I, w- I will yeah. do it because, like, what, what are the other alternatives? I'll take this $36,000 a year job at MTV – Right, because that's an opportunity. Um, if I'm making thirty six thousand dollars at Home Depot, I'm, I'm gonna get trapped at home. So why right. did I leave MTV? Because I grinded at MTV. I I, yeah. I killed it at MTV. Tell me I, about that. I I learned so much at MTV about the corporate world and about social media. It was my first corporate job in the city. It was my first social media gig where like I was right. responsible for daily content and growing. The following and, um, you know, raising awareness for our TV shows and our personalities. And I told you I was making 36. Um, (laughs) I got I got up to making 50 and then 51 with like a merit increase. But you know what? I just got to the point there where like like I was working on Nick Cannon show Wild and Out killing it behind the scenes. Yeah. And they just weren't giving me any credit for anything. I wasn't getting yeah. any raises. And there was I remember, no, like, there's no percentage. You you weren't on like a percentage anonymous. metric. You're anonymous. Yeah. You you yeah. work in a social media position, and I these are two these are two straws that broke the camel's back. I had a, another social media coordinator that I worked with. His name is Tim. Shout out to Tim. That's my dog. MTV went through a round of cuts in like 2017. Something happened with the company. I don't know. And they fired this young man. And I'm on my way to work on the bus from exit 109 on the parkway to Port Authority. And I get a text like, yo, man, I just wanted you to know I got let go today. Like, you're on your way in. We got a bunch of stuff that we had to do. But, like, I'm out. And I'm just like, they didn't even check with me. Like, everything we do, like, you and I do. Like, we're the whole team for this whole network, MTV2 and all the shows. Like, they didn't even check with me. And then when I came in, they talked to me. And they just assumed that I could pick up the slack. And I'm like, my, like my checks aren't worth <laughs> my, the amount of slack. So, like, so you're giving me a fifty thousand dollar bonus? You're giving me, a, yeah. They're not no. giving me anything. Yeah. And then the the other straw that broke the camel's back was that you know they 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 made this girl my manager, who was not like in my my opinion she wasn't more talented than me. She just had been at MTV longer, and she didn't even right. know the subject matter. Like, I remember she she mispronounced Nas as Naz 
and Kid Cudi as Kid Cootie. And I'm like, MTV2 was supposed to be, like, alternative, hip-hop, right. men's, like, MTV. Uh, right. And I'm like, this girl can't run this stuff, but she got the manager job over me. So then um, I remember she went out to, like, a gig. That's another thing. They used to let her travel. I never got to travel with M- MTV. She went out to L.A. for a gig, and something went wrong with Nick Cannon, where Nick Cannon was upset about something. And she's on the phone, and she's yelling at me. This girl's younger than me. I'm just like, uh. These people got yeah. me effed up. Like, I, I grind all day. Like, they don't turn social media off. So, technically, I'm working all day, every day, even weekends, and we're right. successful. So, I just flat out came in one day, and I was like, I'm done with this. I'm done. I, yeah. I'm just like, I'm, I am I was in the fan cave. I've worked here for two and a half years, and part of the reason I didn't leave was because I, I took advice from people that were saying, stay at Viacom, stay at MTV, climb yeah. the ladder, climb the corporate, corporate ladder. You're... Get experience, right? I also knew that when I came right. out of college, everything was three to five years of experience. Well, now I have a year of experience at the Fan Cave, two and a half right. years of experience at MLB. Yeah. I can up. go somewhere. I wanted to get back in the sports. I flat out just quit the job. Uh, I remember it was around the 4th of July holiday where they were just like, whatever, don't come back after the holiday. It was like, cool, fine. Like, good sure. luck. <laughs> yeah, right. figure it out. Figure it out without me. I'm literally the one that, like, I created the Wild and Out Instagram, Twitter, which now these accounts have millions of followers. I'm right. the one that put the channels in place, right? I remember YouTube was getting bigger, and Facebook was getting bigger as far as Facebook Watch. And I'm like, listen, right. you guys think that these kids show up for 8 p.m. Uh, Eastern time, 9 p.m. Central or whatever? They're not. These kids want to watch Just stuff because. on demand. Yeah. This is 2017, right. I'm telling them. You have to clip up the show and put it on YouTube, put it on Facebook, right. and then keep loading those up where these kids press play, and then they're given the next one. There. And next thing you know, three hours goes by, and they've watched all the content. They're not right. tuning in at 8 o'clock. They have practice. They have other things. There is a girl that they're talking to. They're not They're not tuning into linear television, and they were so stuck right. on linear television. Like, look at MTV now. Like, nobody cares about MTV now. There's, yeah, there's nothing yeah. on MTV. So I got out at the right time, and a lot of people got out at the right time. And I went to Fubo TV. But in between, like I'm telling you, I, I quit without having a job lined up. That's when I got into Lyft Uber. That's when right. I started driving Lyft Uber and applying to jobs. So I would get up in the morning, 6 o'clock, drive people to work, drive people to school, and get that morning com- commute rush. And I would do that from like 6 a.m. to like 11. And then I would break to get lunch and go home and like check emails and apply to more jobs. Right. And then get back in the car at like 3 o'clock for the uh, commute home. And I would do that from like 3 to 6 or 7. And then my wife would be coming home from her job and I'd meet up with her to eat dinner. And I I did that for a month. I grinded and did that for a month from uh, July, mid-July, after the 4th of July break until like August. And then I started at Fubo TV as their first social media coordinator hired startup company back then i think i was like wow one of the 80th 80 something employees that they hired and i started working there so why did i quit mtv i felt disrespected i felt undervalued i felt underpaid and you know enough was enough where i just i quit i jumped out of the window and i come home and tell my wife i don't have a job anymore um they're gonna pay me out for two weeks or whatever but don't worry like (laughs) i saw an email that said if you complete a hundred rides in 30 days uh, Lyft, <laughs> Lyft will. <laughs> Your backup. So My backup. Was what's, that, the, what's that number for truck masters, Mav? What's the number for truck masters? Yeah, I got a commercial yeah. driver's license. Nah, I just was like, <laughs> I'm gonna right. grind. And oh my god, uh, I I got an extra bonus thousand dollars for completing a hundred rides in thirty days, which I really did in nineteen days because I went yeah. to my orientation and I didn't realize the clock started after you walked out of orientation. Oh. And then I checked the app and it was like, you have nineteen days to complete this. And I hustled. I grinded to get yeah. to that point. And I also sold, like, collector's items that I had, Jordans that I had, furniture that I had. I used to hustle on Facebook Marketplace, on Craigslist, meet right. up with random people just to make a buck. Make them, but make I knew it was all um, a means to an end. I knew. I always knew right. in my mind it was temporary. I, I used to drive Lyft Uber and have a business card in my middle console because people yeah. will ask you, oh, this is what you do professionally? Is this your career? Hell no. Hell no. You hear my voice as I'm talking to you? you like, do I – like, I'm like, I'm a young guy. I'm like, here, this do is my, I my business like, card. Yeah. And my business card at yep. the time said social media manager, content creator, podcast host. Yep. And That's great. Yep. 
that's we're we're getting there. We're getting we're getting closer to modern day. See, we're we're peeling <laughs> we're to peeling day time. layers off that onion, right? And I'm learning more about you, right? And I think that's probably one of the key things, I guess, that I want not just for guests, but like for just general good humans. You want to be a good human? Learn about the people you interact with. Learn about who they are. What what makes them go? So you can learn from their mistakes and also commiserate with them right and i think that it's and that again goes back to being a, a fan and fandom there is a level of commiseration that is i think it binds us as a humanity as a society and that's the problem that's going on in society i think is just no, no one can be empathetic and and that's yeah. that's a big issue so, big and, I mean, so the anyways, internet, the, the internet doesn't help oh, with that because the internet is a cesspool no, I know. and it's not reality. It's bad. So people are it's mean bad. to each other on, online. People disrespect each other online. They don't have empathy. You have people that are hiding online and saying vicious yep. things and yes. they don't have to be held accountable for their words. Um, right. Yeah, that's it. Not being accountable for your own actions and words. And that, that's, again, sports, man. Right. You're accountable. You are accountable. The the. The um, money is going to be counted. The yards are going to be counted. You are accountable. And I, to learn that at a young age, I, I think is I think it's what really benefited you well. So tell me about Fubo a little bit. What what what's the story there? Because I I missed a little bit of that. And you know I, I when I invited you on, I I knew a little bit about the stuff that you had done, and we just kind of personality wise hit it off, but. I didn't know about this stuff very well. So tell me what what is tell me the story with Fubo. It, it was brief. I worked there from August 2018 or 2017 to May 2018. So not wow. even a year, but I love Fubo, man. Fu, Fubo fam forever. My Fubo bros, like we started yeah. something. Like I came in to Fubo and they had hired or they had interviewed like seven different people for their first social media person right you, you know at the time right. they had marketing but they didn't have someone that could like actually do facebook twitter instagram for their yep. brand right. and they had interviewed a bunch of people in the social media fields but they didn't have what they were looking for what they were looking for as a soccer football fubo right fubo, you know that's where they got the name they were a soccer streaming platform that was bringing um, um americans the like Champions League, the Europa League, right. Bundesliga. Like, we right. don't get that on Fox 5. Right. But when they came to the States and they, you know, started up in New York City, they were trying to expand. Fubo is a monster now. But back in 2018, 2017, when I started there, they were trying to attract American fans of the four major sports in America, not soccer, right? They had the soccer community. Right. But now to actually become a cable replacement to become an over-the-top streaming option for cord cutters they needed to attract fans of nfl nba mlb right. nhl i come into my interview and i'm combing through their social media they had two remote guys from o romania doing their <laughs> social media <laughs> shout out to rosvon and biju rosvon yeah, nice. and biju nice. ended up working for me because i come, I come into my interview and I'm pointing out all the things that they did wrong in their social media. Right. And I'm also pointing out, like, they had an error that, to me, was, like, I felt like was unexcusable. It was an all-star game photo of of uh, Cody Bellinger. And I guess they mm -hmm. just made a mistake, but they had him written as uh, Josh Harrison. <laughs> <laughs> Completely different players. White wrong. guy, black guy, different wrong. teams. And I'm like, wrong. how did you publish this? With How did the you copy get this? saying yeah. that this is Josh Harrison? Like you must have copied and pasted it from like maybe some Getty images that you got, and you had the wrong right. player, wrong whatever. Right. And and they were embarrassed. I, I combed through some other things. I'm like, this is incorrect. This should be done like this. They wanted to give me the job right away. Like, can you start now? Yeah. So when they hired me, I came in. I hit the ground running, and I built their social media up quickly. And what I did was put my sports knowledge into their brand, where people right. didn't know who was behind the Fubo account. But I put right. out polls of, like, you know, who won the Heisman this year or, right. you know, Engagement. name this, blah, 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 blah. And then we would do prizes right. and giveaways. And I talked to the marketing team, like, hey, let's get Fubo, Fubo branded stuff to give away on Twitter, on Instagram. Right. Like, 
you know, I just I just had it. I just knew what to do. Uh, right. And I crushed it there. I love Fubo. Dude, uh, pinstripe pride before pinstripe pride, right? Yeah. That, I mean, that's the whole thing. They did pump the social media with the hashtags and the accounts. Hashtags, you were already doing that. Just making Dude. people feel a part of it, right? If you're a subscriber right. to Fubo, we built a community online. And uh, I finally, you know, just got to a place where I was like, yes, like I'm working in sports. I'm working in social media. I'm in New York City at a startup where like the startup culture was awesome. Like they have a keg in this place. You know, they have a ping pong table in this place. Like it was different. (laughs) It sounds like John Boy's place before John Boy had his place, right? I mean, that's we'll get there as well. Uh, So Fubo for me was amazing. But eight months in, I get a LinkedIn message from a young lady at Rock Nation. And she's saying they're looking for a digital marketing manager Mm -hmm. for Rock Nation Sports Agency. So now I'm like, oh, look at me. I'm about to start cooking with gas. I'm like, it was less than a year ago. I was slaving away at MTV (laughs) and felt underappreciated. Yeah. And and, and then, you know, had to quit that job and and drive Lyft Ubers and be disrespected by people getting into my car telling me change the station or drive faster. (laughs) Now Jay Z comes calling, so yeah. I'm like I'm lit. I gotta go see what's behind this door, and right. uh, I did. I did. I uh, I left Fubo, and I remember Fubo had a package set up for me, which probably would have been a raise, um, probably would have been some uh, some stock, uh, having some type of equity in the company. Right. And I I turned it down. I didn't even want to look at it. They had this whole folder. I was like, sorry guys. I'm like I'm like thank you for giving me the opportunity. Like, right. I'll forever be, you know, Fubo fam. I'll always rep the brand, but I have to go see what's on the other side of this door. I'm a, I'm a sports right. fan. I'm a music guy. Yeah. I have That's... to go see what's going on at Rock Nation Sports right. and Music. It's a it's a record label full and a sports agency. Alignment. Yep, full alignment. And it, when you recognize full alignment, you just got to go for it, right? I mean, that like your lady that's been with you that whole time, and she's aligned. Yep, came home and told her, hey, I'm quitting Fubo. I'm going to go to Rock Nation. And we thought at the time, hey, this is, you know, dream job. You can't really get much better than this. Digital marketing manager, I think I was making like 70 or 75,000 there. I was making like 65 at Fubo or 60 at Fubo. I was making 50 at MTV. So I'm climbing the ladder, right? Like I'm at least climbing the money ladder. Exactly. I hated it at Rock Nation. I think it was a combination of a few things. Uh, oh my God! It's twenty. It's twenty eighteen, and you, right. you mentioned John Boy. Uh, I'm friends with John Boy on Yankees Twitter. I'm friends with Joe's McFly on Yankees Twitter. I'm in the right. Bronx Pinstripes crew. Right. Exactly. And well, I'm you seeing... form again a a fandom culture, right? You aligned with fans who really are your tribe, right, Keith? I mean, this is like a clan of fandom Mm -hmm. so there's power in that there is a a weird mystical amazing power and so we all go to rock nation at the same time yeah but doing different things right joe's was working at verizon back then john boy had quit his job um he was working at like a wedding company as their photographer videographer video editor so he's a video editing guy right so Okay. It's All starting right. to like so like I'm I'm at yeah. Rock Nation and here's why I hated it. Um I felt like they were archaic in some of their ways and methods. Right. I felt like they were disconnected on some things and I won't speak too deeply into it cuz I don't want to yeah, talk sure. down on Rock Nation, but I really felt that you know, I spent 3 months there and I got out of there. That's that's pretty much that's barely working yeah. at the place. That's yeah. 90 days. They say you got to have 90 days before you really should do anything right it wasn't even 90 90 days days. it was like i was out again by july 4th weekend (laughs) is it it, you're planning your vacations out you're just like fourth weekend every year of my life something happens i got back with my with my wife uh july 4th 2015 we were out of college i was out of the fan cave and we weren't together and yeah, I, I'm that, not a numerologist, but you should probably you should, should tune into, into like those numbers, man. Like you might want to look into month, that. Seventh month, the 4th of July. Yeah. I, I reached out it. to her after I didn't have a great 4th of July, and I just was like, hey, what are you up to? Like, we should get back together. Not like that, but like we should get together right. and, and, you know, check on each other and, you know, see how uh, things are going. And then that's when we started on, you know, getting back together and on the path that we're on now. But at Rock yeah. Nation, 
You know, it was cool to work with, like, I'm texting Todd Gurley, Geno Smith, Leonard Fournette every day. I'm working on their social media. But what I found was, like, these people work around the clock. They're texting you at midnight. Uh-huh. They're texting you at 6 a.m. This needs to be done. This has to be done. Right. And I'm thinking I'm coming into a manager position where I would have some respect. I would have some, out. some permissions. I would have some trust. Right. Everything we did on social media, they had to double, triple check. It had to be, you know, whatever. It just wasn't for me. And I, at the right. time, I'm seeing people in Yankees Twitter rise with their podcast, with their content, right. going to the stadium. Correct. I remember I, I, I escaped out of Rock Nation one day. I wasn't allowed to leave early, <laughs> but I didn't care because I was going down to Philly. I was getting on the bus at Port Authority, yep. going down to Philly to see the Yankees take on the Phillies. Yeah. And it was awesome. great. I ran into Joe's McFly there. I'm going live on Bronx Pinstripe. Uh, he's going live on his own thing, and we kind of yep. just like I knew I see a familiar face here. Him and his boy Ram. Joe's is my you guy. You have we'll, to we'll, take risks, right? We'll always to. be uh, be linked. And Joe's had already went viral in yeah. 2017 for the whole oh, Devers yeah, reaction sure. to the Chapman right, number that exactly. he gave up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is the summer of 2018, and uh, you know I, I ended up, you know, I just I don't know. I didn't feel like I got a lot of respect at Rock Nation. And I'm seeing people rise. And I had been working in social media now in the city for three years. And I'm like, I know how. I I ended up having to learn how to edit videos at MTV because they fired my video editor. So now I'm like, I know how to write. (laughs) For what, $35,000? You're now a video editor? Congratulations. I I learned how (laughs) to write copy. I learned how to schedule tweets and posts. I learned how to attack when there's something hot or trending. And I learned how to edit videos. So in my mind... In 2018, they weren't even letting me do what I could do at Rock Nation because everything needed to be double, triple checked, and you had to get permission and clearance, and somebody had, you know, somebody higher up had to like approve it. I didn't have time to wait on their approvals. I'm like, you hired me at a manager position. My approvals should be good. Whatever. No, fine. Uh, Don't let the door hit you. Blah 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 blah. It was like a movie, man. Like, see, so I'm going to give you a reality check, right? Because I love you. I love you. When you are mess, look at how social media has destroyed. I'm going to give this away. I'm going to say his name. I'm gonna... Look at what Skip Bayless is holding on to, right? Mm-hmm. When you fire off a tweet and you are paid multi million dollar contracts, there are layers of lawyers sure. precisely to prevent. <laughs> those kind of shenanigans right yeah. here to, to prevent those kind of shenanigans and so yeah i can see why you ran up against it because you are you, i don't know how you played quarterback but i don't know whether you're a run and gun kind of guy or you're a pocket Both. guy Running but gun, you see you seem like you can threat. really move it yeah, yeah right you can seem like you move it and so because of that yeah i could see why rock nation was not where you could maximize your talent. No, no they uh, were trying to – I'm like, listen, in social media, to win, you have to be creative. You have to be in the moment. Uh, and like a yep. moment could pass. I remember uh, draft night, I was with Mo Wagner, and there was another guy, and I'm covering them on draft day. And I'm like, hey, let's put this yep. stuff out to, to hype right. up that. What like these doing? guys are getting drafted tonight. Uh, the head of our like marketing department was on a flight. And we couldn't put anything out until she landed and could have proved it. And I'm like, this is counterproductive. That's and they they rather do nothing than to put something out, whatever. I didn't care. So, And I think part right. of the reason I got the job at Rock Nation was that they fired some people that made some mistakes that they right. did give that permission to. So when I came right. in, they're like, okay, the next people that we're bringing right. in, we're going to not let yeah, whatever. Yeah. It didn't matter. Everything happens for a reason. I'm glad that I worked at Rock Nation. Yes. Uh, I'm glad that I had – just some some times there where I was conflicted, man. There's some deeper things that I forget. I remember I kept the long notes uh, of things like, but it doesn't matter because I don't want to speak down on Rock Nation. I'm sure I'm going no, to. No, 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 But the journaling, <laughs> right? The journaling and the notes are essential for you to reflect on in new situations down the road, too. This is a whole, like, movement now with a guy by the name of Ryan Holiday. I don't know if you ever heard of him, but he is – he basically has translated – um stoic principles and stoicism which is an ancient philosophy which if you were in sports or you were in the military you were already inculcated in stoicism because Mm -hmm. there's an accountability there's the only thing i can control is myself and my how i react to situations and 
that is all Stoic philosophy. That's all old Greek and Roman philosophy that was developed. And um, it, 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 Ryan is a fantastic guy. But what I'm getting at with this is that um, one of the essential things for you to understand to grow and develop courage, wisdom, temperance, and, and uh, bend in the arc of justice is to write down those notes to yourself. Remember, because you'll look back on them. I, I do it every day, and I, I, I've done it for years now. And I just I want to encourage you, keep with that, man. As yeah, you go year, through the rest of this, this year, I'm going to get back to it. it. This this past year, I didn't write enough because it was a whirlwind. So many things yeah. happened, but I want to get back to journaling this year because back then I would go home and I would write down like, "Hey, I overheard this in the office, or yeah. somebody suggested this that I didn't agree with." Like, I got to get out of here. So I do get get out of um, Rock Nation, whatever. I, I barely was there. I don't think anybody even remembers me there. Yeah, well, you learned but, you learned what you didn't want, right? And and that's important too. You know what it was? That was it, right? I, I couldn't go back to Fubo after leaving them and saying, hey, let's, you know, sorry, I, I left to go, for, you know, somewhere I thought was better. Right. I was forced now. I, I, I started applying to other jobs, but I knew this is it, Keith. Like, you've learned how to do social media. You know how to edit videos. Build your brand, right? right. You're a wild sports fan. Uh, right. You love the Yankees. You're in the Yankee world now, at least through Bronx Pinstripes. Like, Bronx right. Pinstripes, I started off as their, like, digital guy, right? What I would do yep. for them is, like, hey, I'm going to Philly, or I'm going to Pittsburgh, or right. I'm going to L.A. Hey, what's up? This Let's is Keith McPherson. Let's yeah. do an Instagram takeover, like, that type of stuff. Um, so that summer, I remember talking to my wife. I'm like, I have my last, like, I don't know, $2,000 that I, like, saved from, you know, working at Rock Nation. And, you know, they did pay me out for a little while, and then I was able to collect unemployment. Okay. Um, so I'm applying to jobs. I'm collecting unemployment for, like, a week or two. But then I, I it clicked. I'm like, I'm going to buy a camera because this is before the phones had 4K cameras in them. I right. went and bought exactly. a Canon, like, the top vlogging camera. Yep. And then I got a new MacBook. So yep. now we're off and running. Where I can take this camera to Yankee Stadium. Hey, what's up, everybody? We're at the stadium, blah, blah, blah. Make a vlog. Put that on YouTube. Right. I, I started building my YouTube channel then. Uh, I started putting more content on my Instagram. Put more content on my Twitter. And edited videos. And started really just putting myself out there. Building my brand. I remember I had this first video uh, where I was like, you know, I'm a wild sports fan. And, like, I'm putting myself out there. And I don't know if this is going to work. But, like, I want you to get to know me and what I'm trying to do. And that was 2018. And in 2019, is that when you started rapping about DJ or was that 2019? That was 20. I think the DJ rap that I had, and I got to get back to making more raps. I think that was during the pandemic because DJ, that was after the 2019 season. Yeah. uh, And I wanted DJ signed so bad. It's funny now. I'm like, I'm looking at DJ. Like, I don't know what this guy's got left, but at that point in time, he was exactly what the Yankees needed. But correct. um, So summer of 2018 passes. Uh, I, I, I go on some interviews and I'm striking out. I, 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 I'm conflicting the universe, right? I'm on one hand building my online presence, my brand under my name, Keith McPherson, right. Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. But then behind the scenes at home, I'm still driving Lyft Uber. Um, I'm applying to jobs and I start working at this restaurant called House of Q. Never worked at a restaurant before, but I was Barbecue literally- Barbecue place? Yeah, barbecue place in Weehawken, right next to the What ferry. kind of barbecue? What kind of barbecue? Uh, ribs, um, brisket, chicken. I don't know. It was just, I think there's a house of Q now in Hoboken and one in American Dream. Okay. The one that I worked at doesn't exist anymore. But Ooh, what happened then was maybe I, it's not good barbecue. <laughs> right. Yeah, it wasn't that great. It was like, I don't know. I, like, yeah. it wasn't that great. Like, after 10 minutes, it's not good anymore. <laughs> like, yeah, well, it's the kind of barbecue that, like, you can't save. Like, I would take home meals yeah. at the end of the night, and I'm like, this oh, isn't that no. great. Once it's not hot anymore, you try to reheat it. But um, yeah. I was losing my oh, mind. My right. Now we are in uh, 2019, the beginning of 2019. I've been unemployed, and I'm, I'm interviewing – not getting jobs. I interviewed at Foot Foot Action Foot Locker two rounds. Was starting to tell people like, "Hey, I can get you discounts. I'm about to be the new social media manager of Foot Action." Right. They ghosted me. I interview in February at 
Major League Baseball, and I have connections at Major League Baseball right. from the fan cave. They ghosted me. So now I'm like, no more interviews, man. Like, I'm just like, I'm depressed. Like, I got to really go for it. And uh, I worked at this restaurant, House of Q, for two months, February and March, just so I could get some extra income. I'm still driving Lyft Uber. I'm still right. creating and building my brand. People don't know I work right. at this restaurant. My wife knows, whatever. No one had to know. I was just, you know, making some extra change and getting out of the house, giving myself something like a schedule. Yeah, you like, got to okay, get out of the house. Right, yeah. You got to get out of the house. The house was you driving me nuts. House. Like, that's what, yep. that's when I say I was losing my mind. Yep. I was having deja vu of the same days. I was watching, like, Gary Vee motivational stuff. I was falling down YouTube rabbit holes of these, like, <sighs> influencer kids that have these, like, <laughs> L.A. mansions. They, just, <laughs> right. they create content every day, and I'm like, these kids are making millions <laughs> off of You're playing Minecraft. In LA. Rip. Yes, correct. And I'm, yeah. and I'm, and I'm stuck here in, in Jersey City. Uh, trying to find a job, trying to you know yep. be successful, and it wasn't adding up. But what I knew was that the baseball season was coming, and we started the podcast George's Box Under Bronx Pinstripes in right. March of that year. I was successful with it because Bronx Pinstripes yep. was successful, and they basically started off their feet put us on their feet myself and jj who used to work for barstool whatever we yep. come together to start this yankees podcast and now we're off and running so i ended up doing some like freelance social media work just you know selling stuff still but right. now the yankee season is rolling and i want it to be available because i knew like right i'm gonna cover the yankees and i'm gonna start to like rise in this yankee universe like john right. boy like joe's like hubs right. from barstool right and uh you know long story short we do that whole season but by the end of that season, Yes Network finds me. I'm on a top ten list of like Yankees content creators, influencers. Right, no I doubt. I link with their producers at a game. One of their producers has a storyboard idea for a commercial called Fandom Acts of Kindness. Boom! Yes. September, I'm in my first Yes Network commercial. December, I'm in my second Yes Network commercial. Right. I'm still broke. I'm still figuring it out. But like, I'm able right. to make but money off of those things. There. I'm able to be on TV, and I start to feel like it is working. I'm starting to feel right. like, okay, it is happening. It, I am breaking through. Um, December, I go on the interview, and that's why if you saw recently December 19th, 2019, yeah. that yep. day is a special day for me because December 18th, 2019, I'm still confusing the universe because I don't have the money. Like I don't have yeah. the seventy seventy five thousand dollars I was used to having. I don't have the benefits, and I'm like, all right. I got to go back. It's cool that I'm in a commercial. It's cool that I'm getting followers in Yankees right. Twitter. I got like 4,000 followers in Yankees Twitter. Cool. But it's not amounting to dollars. I got to go back to applying a job. So I get with a creative agency that hooks me up with an interview at Spartan Race. And I crush the interview at Spartan Race. They like my resume and they like what I've built outside of myself. They're like, okay, so not right. only – could you do social media for brands? You built your own personal brand where, like, you're right. becoming popular. People are starting to look at you as, like, a Yankees content creator, a sports right. guy. Yes. They offered me the job on the spot. I took the job that day. The next morning I wake up to a text that uh, we can't offer you the job. I, actually, we can't come to terms with the creative agency. There was, like, a $10,000 difference between, like, what they expected to pay and what the agency wanted for providing the talent, right. whatever. So now I'm like, what am I supposed to do? Like, I keep losing. I'm striking out. Like, I yeah. I, I got ghosted at MTV, thought I had the job. I got That's ghosted slumped. at Foot Action, thought I had the job. And I stopped applying to jobs for a little bit. But then when I do go back to trying to get back into the corporate world, I'm like, this is it. And my wife said, what do you want to be? Stop confusing the universe. Right. Like, the universe doesn't know if you want to be Keith McPherson. The universe doesn't know if you want to be Correct. social media manager at a company. universe doesn't know if you want to drive Lyft, Uber, work at a restaurant. You're doing all these different things to survive. You've got to just put your foot in the ground and go. And I actually yep. I got into a Lyft, Uber accident uh, right before that. And I stopped driving Lyft, Uber because my, yep. my wife, my mom, they're like, you're too valuable to us to be, like, getting in a car accident, driving around Jersey City, Union City, Weehawken, right. Hoboken. And so, like, that zapped another source of income. Yeah. And I remember, like, my family telling me, you got to just get a job anywhere. It doesn't have to be a corporate job. Go work at Walmart. I'm like, no. I went and sat at the Amazon, right. like, there was a, not Am like, Amazon. You know, you can work at these Amazon right, the uh, warehouses. The warehouses. I went yeah. to a hotel and sat through the first orientation, and I looked around at the people that was there. No disrespect to people that work at Amazon. 
um, and I listened to what I would have to be doing, and I, and I walked out. Yeah. I'm like, nah, yeah. I, I can't. I can't do this. So I went home, and I really started to lean into stuff, whatever. I don't get that job at Spartan Race. That gets pulled from under me, and that's when I put out that video, which was like a declaration. I told the story yeah. about having a job, a senior social media job that would have paid me like 75000 a year. I'm you know, going back and forth. Do I want to be in the corporate world, or do I want to go for it and try and be me? And I said, right. this is it. I w- and I was so down. I had like $10 in my checking account at the time. Hmm. Christmas was so hard that year. But uh, you know what? I just knew, like, this is the universe testing me again. Like, you you thought you had a job lined up to go backwards? No, yeah. go forward. And I put out, like, a proclamation. Like, I literally said, I'm yeah. going to work in sports. This is what I love to do. This is what I've always wanted to do. You're, you're going to hear from me. You're going to see me. Thank you for the support, Yankees Twitter. Like, when we go into 2020 – it's full steam ahead, no looking back. Sports, content creation, podcasts, videos, all that type of stuff. And that, then what happened? So then that was December. I remember I started talking to John Boy a little bit more because John yeah. Boy and I had already had a relationship. Joe's that summer joined John Boy after talking to me yeah. about, hey, you quit your job. Like, I'm trying to get into this full time. Like, what do you think I should do? And I'm like, listen, John Boy already le- legit has a company. Like, John Boy right. already is on his way to being a juggernaut in, in this field. Like, I could just see it. I, I just knew. I'm like, John Boy is going to be huge. Uh, yeah. So I'm like, go. If John Boy will have you and is interested, bring your podcast to John Boy right. and work right. with just him. Just make a network. Yeah. Exactly. Instead of working against I remember, like, saying, I was like, we're stronger together. We're all rooting right. for the same team. We're all in the same market. We're all doing the same things. It's the We're same stronger tribe. together. So I stopped messing with Bronx Pinstripes. They did me dirty. Um, I did 30 episodes of George's Box. It was successful. Yep. But, like, they didn't give me a seat at the table. I made $0 yeah. with them. The podcast is successful. I want to make merch. They they right. don't they don't listen to my merch ideas. I end up linking with Ray Digme. Shout out to Ray Digme. Ray Digme was someone that along the lines, I'm down in the dumps. He had been following me on Instagram. He reaches out to me. He sends me a box of clothes from his clothing company, like $300 right. worth of clothes. And he's like, you right. are the kind of guy I want to represent my brand. When nobody right. was checking for me, somebody on Instagram. And, and he had saw me in the MLB fan cave because um, Eric Young Jr. Yeah. from the Mets had came to the fan cave. And he was wearing Dig Me whatever. You know, you never know oh, who's watching. Go. Man, that picked right. me up. I, I was like, somebody is, is, is rooting for me. I got to keep going. So dig me, I go to with my ideas for the shirts. We make right. replace for twenty eight. That year was the year where everybody was getting hurt, and yeah. chase for twenty eight turned into replace yeah. for twenty eight because Gio Urshela yeah. came up, Mike Talkman, Tyler Wade was playing. Yeah. Um, so I sold a bunch of shirts and Bronx pinstripes. They felt like I should have went through them, and I tried to go through them. Of yeah, course, they had right. the idea first, but they had the first right of refusal as well. We had a falling out. So now True. I am just alone, right? Like, now I'm just myself right. in the Yankees' Twitter space. But I would already had relationships with Joes, with Jake, with John Boy. Right. So I started talking to them, and, and John Boy didn't know my background at all. He had just known me from Yankee Stadium. Yankee <laughs> right, like, I see this dude at the and, game. Uh, He's an awesome dude. Yeah. Literally, just that, right? Like, they, they did an event at Yankee Stadium for Talking Yanks, and I went and joined them. I just pulled up yep. on their section. And I shot videos and stuff. That rubbed Bronx pinstripes the wrong way, too, right? They're, they were looking yeah. at John Boy as competition. I never was looking at John Boy yeah. as competition. I was right. looking at everybody in the Yankees universe like we root for the same teams. If you're, right. if you're, a, Red Sox, if you're a Red Sox Stupid. guy, then sure, you're competition. Like, then I don't want to work right. with you. But John well, Boy— Jared's not really competition to you. Nah, and shout out to Jared. I've been, <laughs> able to, I've been able to link with him. We're good friends. And, uh, you know, yeah, we've been yeah, on, yeah. on uh, off base on MLB Network together, and, and we talk nice. now. but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What happened next was John Boy had a spot for me. They didn't know what the, you know, spot would be. But once I right. sent my resume, I had a FaceTime with John Boy. And I'm like, listen, bro, I can do social media stuff. I'm already doing podcasts. My podcast with Bronx Pinstripe w- was successful. Maybe I start a podcast under you guys. What happened was I joined Joe's McFly's podcast, Pinstripe Strong, with him and Chris. Right. And then I took what was an intern job, fifteen dollars an hour with John Boy. Huh. Okay. Fifteen dollars an hour. All right. Better than 
nothing, right? Right, and you get drive to play and wiffle Uber. ball. And yeah. right, I got to go kick it with guys that I had already been following. I'd already been listening right, to exactly. Talking Yanks while I was unemployed watching Gary V videos. I also was listening to Talking Yanks podcasts, right. and I'm like, if these guys are doing it, I could do it too. And uh, you know, I always have respect for John Boy for giving me a shot and bringing me on board with what he was creating, what he was doing. There was someone at John Boy that had said. You know, I came in, and I'm coming in with my corporate experience. So I'm hitting right. Slack. I'm hitting emails like, here's what we need to do. Here's some numbers, blah, blah, right. blah, blah, blah. And I'm changing exactly. things right away. And someone at the company is like, hey, this guy has experience. He's worked at Rock Nation, Fubo TV, MTV. You're not going right. to be able to keep him at $15 an hour. Right. So I worked from – I remember we launched the Bronx office on January 17th, and the video had, like, me, Joe's, Jake, John Boy, like, hey, uh, John Boy's moving from down the shore to New York. We're going to be right down the street right. from Yankee Stadium. We're bringing Joe's in. We're bringing Keith in. We're going to just talk about sports and create content. So after we launched the video, I officially came on board at $15 an hour. I'm in the John Boy office, like, building tables and putting together chairs. And, <laughs> Ikea uh, style. Right, bringing in it. Yankees memorabilia to decorate. Yep. It was, like, grassroots, like, a great time. I always remember that time. And then someone says, you got to bump this guy up. So they did bump me up to, like, sixty-five or 65000 which was yeah. like a going rate for a social media manager in right. in New York. And I was uh, tasked with building the John Boy Media like flagship Instagram and Twitter, and I was the first one running that. But I was also doing podcasts uh, for the Yankees with Pinstripe Strong with Joes, and then right. I was given the opportunity to build Talking Nets. Right, which is a very big deal. And if, for those that don't know um, – Keith has, I, I, I think, in my mind, um, Keith has promoted the Nets to where they are. And don't, I mean, this is not on the players of that stuff. But on the awareness uh, in, in, in my mind, in the tri-state area, Nets would not be where they are awareness-wise without Keith, without you. I can't take that credit, but I appreciate that. I'm stand, telling but... you. I'm te- Listen, I know a lot of those other guys. You ask around and the other people covering the Nets. You ask the people that are broadcasting the Nets. Yeah. I know a lot of them. I know a lot of them. And, and like, I, I'm sure I, there's one I was just texting with today who probably kicked me in the nuts for that and said that, um, and he's going to be on the podcast. But um, I'll tell you right now, your passion is what, what seeps through, right? I mean, I, and so, and that, that's just my conjecture with that. But more importantly, so what did you learn from all of that? What did you learn? Like you just told a fantastic tale. What did you learn? Remember, this is the keep next going. step. This is, just keep going. Yeah. Just keep going. It's going to suck. It's going to be hard. But like take the road less traveled, right? It, like you, you have to go through it to get to it. At all of these stops, I could have – folded at all of these stops i could have quit i could have stopped going and stopped pursuing but i just had in my mind like this is what i meant to do and i'm going to get there it's a means to okay i'll take 15 dollars an hour i i knew what john boy was building was going to be fun successful and it was an opportunity again for me to get out of the house i didn't mention right. that january of 2020 i started with them march of 2020 i became full-time my first full-time check was the 15th. That same week, we fell into the pandemic. Yeah. That same week, they stopped the NBA. That same week, sports were done. What are we supposed to do? We're a, we're a sports media company. Keith, what are what we did supposed you do? to do? We just opened an office in the Bronx that technically we're not allowed to go to. Right. W- what did you do? I I locked in, um, and I and I honestly think that that this is is part of what started my. I don't know how to put it into words, but like my not seeing eye to eye with John Boy and John Boy Media, because I remember the pandemic hit and I had like a party set up at Billy's. We had to cancel the party. And that's how I knew, oh, this is serious. We can't even have this kickoff party. And then John Boy and Jake made this video where they're like drinking out of each other's water. They're like touching each other (laughs) because at the the start of this, we had just came from spring training. I remember yeah. buying a six-pack of Corona at spring training saying, if I drink enough Corona down here, 
I could be immune to the coronavirus. We did not know it was a meme. It was a joke. It was an internet thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, then it got real serious real fast. And I remember I was the first one in the company. I was like, I'm going to start self-quarantining. I don't know what that exactly is, but I heard about it. And like, I, sh like, I went home that night. I think it was March 10th or 11th. And, and the city was eerie. Like, my commute from the Bronx yeah. back to West New York, there wasn't as many people on the bus. There wasn't as many people on the train. At, like, yep. 7 or 8 o'clock at night, I'm like, okay, it started to get spooky out here. And the people yep. that were there had masks on. And I had never really seen that many people. Right. Uh, so I'm like, okay, I, I'm not coming into work tomorrow. Then they canceled the NBA that day. And yeah. then it was my wife's birthday on the 12th, and that was the day that, like, sports stopped. Now officially, like, NBA got canceled that night, the 11th. Now the rest mm -hmm. of these sports are done. And, uh, you know, John Boy, Jake, and some of those guys kept going to the office. And it is what it is, but I wasn't going to chance that. My wife ended up getting COVID very early on, like April. Yeah. I wasn't going to chance That's it. I, I'm not going to the office. I'm working remote. And I understand that you guys are building a company, and we all need to be together. But I'm just going to lock right. in on what I could lock in on, which was right. Pinstripe Strong and Talking Nets. So yep. I was the social media manager for Pinstripe Strong. I was the social media manager for Talking Nets and the host of the podcast. So every day I'm putting together content around the Yankees, around the Nets for both of those brands right. on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. And then I'm bringing my energy into the show. Right. I'm doing that. And those properties are like fringe properties of John Boy Media. John yeah. Boy and Jake aren't in those shows. Mm -hmm. They're part of the overall umbrella, but they are afterthoughts. They're not making any money for the company yet. Right. They are, you know, right. they're not That's as important. Building. Right. So I think the disconnect started because um, I started focusing more on that. And as the social media manager, I had to delegate responsibilities for some people underneath me. Um and I gave some of my responsibility to a young man that's working there still who crushes it named Kyle. I gave him yep. the keys to the to the John Boy Media like flagship handles. Like you run with this. Right. I'll handle Pinstripe Strong and Talking Nets. I'm on the podcast. Like you're not yeah. a Nets fan. I know you're a Yankee fan, whatever. Um so like the pandemic hits its weird times, right? Like it's strange times. And and looking back. You know, we made a lot of decisions and did a lot of things that are that are just, like, weird or awkward now. And then when we came out of the pandemic, I remember the start of 2021, telling yeah. John Boy and Jake, hey, listen, guys, like, I, I'll always remember telling them straight up. I'm like, I don't know when I'm going to debut in the John Boy Media universe. Like, I felt like I was a fringe bench guy. Right. They wanted me to be more behind the scenes helping, which I, I certainly did. But I right. felt my own brand rising. I felt my own name right. rising. Yes Network comes in and they want to do a special on Talking Nets. Yeah. We did a special on Talking Nets in the John Boy Media office. You know, they, you know, they, people outside people started to build me up. And I don't think the right. company looked at me as a star or face of the company, which was fine. Uh, I was being paid to do social media behind the scenes, but right. other things started to evolve with me being myself, making right. my Nets podcast. Kevin Durant follows Talking Nets. Now Talking Nets is rising. Like, correct. The followers are going up. The downloads are going up. I'm like, what did like I if you didn't see this coming, <laughs> that's not my fault. Um, right. But, you know, things started to go a certain way where I told John Boy and Jake, like, I might not debut in your universe on your YouTube, YouTube your YouTube channel or your shows. But right. like, I'm already this like I've already been in right. Yes Network commercials. I've already got connections. I've already got people checking me. You're checking for me where like I know I'm I'm paid to do this. But you got other people doing it, and you don't want me focusing on Pinstripe Strong and Talking Nets because they're not making money, but they will. Like, they're getting right. there. Right. So we had a little bit of a falling out internally that people never really knew about externally. But I knew. I'm like, I, I'm headed somewhere out, outside of here. Like, I remember right. saying, like, you know, I'm like, my worth, right? I'd already made more than 60000 a year. So the 60000 a year they were paying me, I'm like, I'm worth more than this right now. Right. And this is 2021, my second year with the company. Um, I, I kind of knew that, like, the media market in New York, someone was going to recognize me combing through the John Boy Media umbrella, uh, being right. on the Yes Network, doing things with the Yes Network still, being in two sports, two leagues, right? right. John Boy Media is really baseball. But I was one person at John Boy Media, like, this guy knows this shit in baseball and basketball. He covers the Nets. He covers the Yankees. Right. And I'm rising. And at the end of 2021, 
John Boy and Jake were doing some small hits on WFAN with like Moose and Maggie. And right. like August 6th, I think it was, they took over Moose and Maggie's 10 to 2 show. And right. it basically sounded like talking Yanks. It was great. Yeah. They talked mostly Yankees. It was during the Yankee season. And then Spike Eskin, who was the program manager, started trying to get John Boy and Jake and John Boy Media involved with WFAN more. Right. That never materialized. But I was offered to try out on August 25th. I went in on that Wednesday night, had no idea what to expect or what to do, had listened to WFAN. Right. I go in and I crush it, 11 to 2. From what I understand, the social media interaction from Yankees Twitter that I already had, that started to hit WFAN. Their social team it. wakes up the next morning and they're like, we got a ton of interaction off this guy. Right. We got a ton of people tweeting and talking about this, people calling in. The Yankees were off that night. The Mets had played. They lost to the Dodgers. I come in with this whole agenda to talk about the Yankees winning streak. Ooh. They want to talk about why they pulled Taiwan Walker. And yeah. I don't know, it created a little bit of a stir because I'm a Yankees fan. And at the time, I didn't care to talk about the Mets. But whatever. Right. I do a good job. And I don't know what to expect from it. But uh, time goes on. And I'm checking in with Spike Eskin. Like, hey, man, uh, let me get another let me get another tryout. Like, let me fill right. in on a night. Like, I just want to, you know, I, I I don't know if I was good enough. I want to try again. And he's telling me, no, right. you, you did well. And we're working on some things. I'll, I'll get back to you. Little did I know, August, September, October comes around. We're getting to the end of the baseball season. I'm a little bit frustrated with, you know, feeling like I'm second-class citizen at John Boy Media, feeling like I'm not getting the respect that I deserve for who I literally am outside of the company, inside of the company. I didn't get right. a raise. Like, things are happening at the company, and <laughs> I don't have a seat at the table. And I'm like, I'm I one of the it. most experienced, most qualified guys. Here comes WFAN, and they proposition me with the opportunity to take over nights and replace Steve Summers. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. I thought I was going to be a weekend guy, a late night fill in, right. still work at John Boy Media, but maybe do some hits right. here and there. No, they have bigger plans for me. God's plan yeah. is always greater than our own. God had a greater plan than I was even ready for. Uh, so I accepted. And then November yeah. 1st, I hit up John Boy and I. Gave my two weeks notice. And then November 15th, I started at WFAN. My first show was November 23rd. The rest is history. <laughs> but it's our current. <laughs> now we're current. Now we're right. we're back to where we are. Like, how did how did that all happen? And uh, I'm blessed to say, you know, from being on WFAN just for a couple months, everybody listens to the fan in New York. MLB Network folks were listening to WFAN. And I'm so passionate about the Yankees and baseball and talking about the fan right. cave and all of this stuff. They reach out. I go down to spring training. I rock with John and Susan. I'll never forget yep. sitting in between John and Susan on the broadcast from spring training. MLB Network reaches out saying that they have a show with three people and they're looking for a fourth. They like my yep. vibe. They like my energy. And they want me to come in for rehearsals to read with the cast. Sure. I do two rehearsal shows and I – I think I steal the show. I think I had some of the best lines, some of the best one-liners and responses. Right. And they hit me up, and they're like, what do we got to do to bring you on board to sign you to get this going? And this is, like, opening day is next week. So I had yeah. to sign and go, and here right. we are now from starting in November, being on December, January, February, March, four months. MLB Network comes in. Now April starts. I have a nationally televised – MLB Network show called Off Base, the first of its kind. Right. That's Love bringing it. in social media and and fashion and music and trying to attract younger people to the game. And then I'm yes. on at night, and I have younger people calling my show. They never heard this many young kids call WFAN. Of course. And I'm bringing my style and my energy, which is different than they've ever heard on WFAN. A young black right. guy that's rapping on the fan. A young, a young black guy that's bringing in, you know, different people than they've ever heard right, with correct. a different style and cadence, and things start to shift. And I'm blessed. Exactly. I get verified on Twitter, Instagram. Like this year, 2022 is the best year of my life. So Keith, great year. But I imagine even from when you had sports and when you were um, throwing the pigskin till now, you, you've had your detractors. 
What do you do when someone says, oh, well, you know, he, he is a monotone voice or, oh, I, you know, I don't like the it. way that I'm his. I've been, yeah. I've been counted out. I've been wrongfully diagnosed. I've been <laughs> treated lesser and looked right. at as, you know, I, I'm used to it. I don't look at myself that way. I don't view myself right. that way. So <laughs> it doesn't matter. What, what you think of me is really not any of my business. I know what I think I am. I and I and I love that. Like this year, it came full circle. I I, right. I, I literally have a sign for 2023 that says "Leave no doubt" for yeah. this year. Can you do it again? Good 2022, but leave yeah. no doubt this year that you are who you think you are. Right. And that you are where you are for a reason. Do it again. Leave no doubt. Yeah. So I'm my entire life I've had people. You know, go back to football. I I can't tell you all the details, but. I wasn't supposed to start varsity as a sophomore. There was another guy in front of me whose brother played, whose dad played, who uh, the whole town looked at as he's the quarterback. Right. I beat him out in camp. I had better scrimmages than him, but they couldn't start me. I remember the coach saying, hey, you're younger than him. He's going to get the first crack at right. it. Right. He gets hurt in week two. There you and go. And then never gets his spot back because I go into the game and it's a different energy. Whoa, offense right. looks different now. This kid can throw. This kid can run. He's young. Right. He's small. But I like. I'm used to it. I, I'm used yeah. to being wrongfully diagnosed. Um, I'm used to being. Seen I like how as, you say that, and I'm a doctor on the. It's perfect. <laughs> wrongfully <laughs> diagnosed. Like this guy, right. you know. Uh, like people, people looked at me like I was a bad guy because I got arrested when I was young. Yeah. I'm not a bad guy. I just was in a in a white town, one of the only black kids that stuck stuck out like a right. sore thumb. Yep. There was it's racial profiling. They yeah. want to knock you down so that you don't make it. I knew that very young. Let's stack yep. charges on this young man so he can't yeah. get a job. So he can't that was be successful. Unfortunate. Yep. Unfortunate. Very but unfortunate. I overcame. I overcame. They will never the stop case. me. They will never stop me. No one will stop me. I love it. I love it. It's the best, right? And if you approach with that mindset, right? You know, there's a story. I, I don't know if you know. Um, uh, but uh, Kobe Bryant tells a story um, about how and uh, he, he was getting ready to work out and he was at a workout and one of the opposing players came in while Kobe was working out. The opposing player um, went about his business, went and worked out and noticed that Kobe was already completely sweating. And so he did his workout like an hour, hour and change. And then he goes and he, he sits down. And Kobe continues to work out and Kobe continues, pushes through, waits for the dude to leave and continues to work out that night. Um, Kobe drops like 40 points uh, on the team. And so the player comes up to him at the end of the game and he's like, dude, I noticed that you worked out like you were there before me and you stayed after me. Why'd you do that, man? And he said, because I wanted to let you know. That no matter how hard you work, I was going to outwork you. I was going to outwork you. And that, to me, Keith, seems like your story, right? It seems like your story. And not to say that you have like a chip on your shoulder, but I think we all have to a little bit. I have a to huge let, chip on my shoulder. Yeah, I'm relentless. To, <laughs> to let others know that we will outwork them. That principle, I, I think... Even when you're down, even when you have stuff, right? I mean, I could go through all the stuff I had. I had DWI. I mean, I, I shouldn't, I shouldn't be a doctor. I should, <laughs> I should have had a felony charge and not gone to medical school. Same. Like literally, right before medical school, I was on the one yard line. Oh yeah, no fumble, right? Yeah, God saved and, me, and spared just, me a couple charges and a couple different you got things it. that could have literally derailed this whole thing. I, I, I was not supposed to make it. <laughs> That's right. why I'm, I'm endlessly motivated. And I, uh, I carry myself with this, like, I carry myself with this, like, knowledge of, like, I beat the odds. Like, yeah. it was a small percentage chance that I could become this. Right. And people don't know my story. And it is up yeah. to me to keep going and tell my story to inspire the next person that can be that 1%. You got it. That's it. That's it, Keith. I feel like when, 
when you make it. And this is part of like the Hippocratic Oath too. It says when you become a doctor, you take an oath that you will teach the yeah. next generation. You're not going to charge them. It's going to be free and you'll gladly do it for those who want to learn and know. And so I, I listen, <laughs> we put some mileage in here, you and me. I know you're used to a five hour show. So I, I appreciate it. <laughs> we, we, we've got yeah, some no, good stuff. Yeah, no, I. I appreciate you, Doc. I respect yeah. you. Uh, you know, when you and I connected online, it was just Yankees fans, yeah. Yankees Twitter. I love seeing you at the stadium. You You've hooked me up with tickets at times, yeah, times yeah. where you probably That's didn't good. know. I didn't have two nickels to scratch together. Well, I was going to buy the cheapest yeah, ticket in the place. I'm going to tell you a story. Do you know how glad I feel over the years, like uh, making sure I reach out to you for a ticket and be yeah, like, hey, you man, I'm not going. You put me in Legends in, in, uh, a couple times when I would have been, you know, probably just chilling in the bleachers. So, man, uh, you know, I knew that I'm was happy just a to genuine fan. Like, hey, I can't make it to the game, Keith. You got it. Sure. You, like, upgraded me. And, uh, you know, the times we've got to meet in person are always yeah. great. And uh, I watch your content. I remember when you did start the YouTube channel and you had some of the COVID stuff. I watched that. And, uh, you know, I love I, that. I'm grinding it out. Things. You, yeah. Social media, podcast. Like, that shows your hunger to not be yeah. stagnant, to evolve. I always say to people, evolve or dissolve. If you're not trying new things yep. and, and you're staying the same, you're going to be left behind. And uh, you're, you're not going to be left behind. You're going to keep going and evolving and doing your thing in your profession. Like, you're a doctor. You don't have to be doing these things. <laughs> these things great. are because I love them, right? right? This is my passion is being able to educate and chat. Can, can I pick your brain about a couple of things? Sure. All right. So, you know, we get on social media. We get on Twitter. And Twitter is one of these interesting places. Now, you're in, you're in a field of Twitter that is controversial, no doubt. But it's not like you say the wrong thing and you're going to get arrested or lose your medical license, right? And so with me, we have to be a little bit more guarded when we say stuff because people say, oh, you gave me medical advice. Now I'm going to sue you and all, yeah. all these sorts of things, right? I mean, uh, occasionally I'm sure you'll get a degenerate caller on <laughs> FAN. It's like, dude, you said to go with the points, <laughs> right? Yeah, I've, I've had uh, some people try to call me out on some things, so. <laughs> whatever <laughs> it happens but there are some times where our fields intersect right and um and a lot of doctors um tried to conjecture on De uh damar hamlin's uh, un unfortunate event that happened in the nfl in the field and i i just want to get i want to get your take right in terms of how that was handled on social media what 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 could have been done better made me hate twitter that night and even with some yeah. things that i said it's what i hated was the police the twitter police that like this is something that nobody expected no one knows what's going on no one knows exactly how to react to it right some people said some things that they regretted but some people were just you know speaking freely even me I, you know and i didn't say anything wrong um there was only what, what do you tweet. mean by wrong like i mean that's and another... it really isn't wrong right but it's like right. you know i think what it was was that in the moment people felt like you shouldn't be detracting from the story and the young man and and his condition with anything else right donovan mitchell scores right. 71 points for the cleveland cavaliers he gets back to right. the locker room he's celebrating it and people are like <laughs> How dare you? Do you right. not know what's going on? No, I don't know what was going on. I I'm just played a four quarters of an NBA game. Yeah. For me, out of uh, lights out, by the way. Like, I'm, I'm a football lights player. Out. I spoke to my experience, and I, I said to someone, like, what's scary is that this could have happened to anybody, Yeah. and it's such a freak thing. And I'm like, I played football 11 years. I'm shook now. And somebody replied to that tweet, and they were like, way to make it about yourself. And I'm like, I deleted the tweet because I'm like, I don't even want that kind of energy. Right. Don't need to I, fight. I was in my fantasy football championship. I didn't tweet yeah. it, but I was thrust into WFAN as the first host to talk about it. I was supposed to right. go on at 12. My show started at 1030 because they suspend the game at 10 o'clock. I'm getting in the car. Right. Like, somebody's got to go on air. The game coverage is not going to go to midnight. No one, there's no one there to prep me on how to handle this. I, did, I come in, and I'm like, you know. People were people bet on this game. I won a hundred bucks on Tyler Boyd first touchdown. Right. I also am in the running to win eight hundred dollars in my fantasy football championship, and now that's on hold. And some people right. tweeted me, they were like, 
what an idiot. This guy's talking about fantasy football. Nobody cares about your fantasy football team. And I go on air, yeah. and I'm like, you're an idiot. If you don't understand that I played college football, that I have compassion, and that I am hurt right now seeing that, but I'm also speaking to fandom that all of us going into that game were thinking about our bets and our fantasy team or whatever our rooting interest was. You got it. It's unfortunate that the game got zapped because we had someone literally go into cardiac arrest. But right. does that mean that, like, we can't speak about the fandom and other things around it or just in the moment speak freely on how we feel or what we thought. Twitter sucked that night because it was like everyone, like even with the NFL, right? The NFL took an hour, and I don't care that it took an hour to postpone the game. I think there were right. other things that they were trying to figure out and decipher. I think they were trying to right. figure out, hey, what is what is wrong? Like, is he okay? Is he coming back yeah. to life? Well, like, Holy shit, do we – I'm sorry, I swear I ain't going to have to yeah. bleep that out, but now do we have to worry about all of our players? Exactly. Right? And that that's a very real question. That 53 I guys can tell on you. each side, they're, sh they're shooken up. They yeah. can't play that game. But I think the number one thing was like, wait, the, the whole country just saw this kid's body go limp. And like yep. now he's not at the stadium anymore. We've got to keep in touch with the you know his mom, the medical people, whatever. Right. Twitter is a fake place. I said it on the radio all the time. Twitter ain't real. You guys can go yep. on Twitter and hide. I've been on Twitter for years, since 2009, as Keith McPherson. My face, yep. my name, next to all of my words. Right. So whatever I say, I stand on. And I also have the experience of being a social media man manager. I know not to just put anything out there or say anything ridiculous. I don't even curse on Twitter. Right. I don't even write out curse words on Twitter. Um, yep. But, yeah, Twitter is a cesspool, <laughs> and there's a lot of idiots on Twitter. It's actually one of the capitals of them. But it's not a real place at the end of the day. It's a place where people can right. hide and, and put right. it's like their metaverse. opinions out. It's and, the metaverse, yeah. right, whatever you want to call that. Now – Next, next question, right? Serious question. And so I've been on the radio, right? I was on um, KTU. I, I've been on Bloomberg. Just a lot of kind of this sort of stuff. Um, what's the what's the number one lesson you've learned so far with your time at WFAN? Um. <laughs> The radio is powerful, and that microphone tells the truth. People are listening. They can hear the breath in your voice, the inflection and in, in, in the, in the tone in your voice. They can tell if you know what you're talking about or not. You can't fake right. it. If you didn't watch the game, they know you didn't watch the game. If you don't right. keep up with hockey, they, they could tell, right? And so what I did, I don't keep up with hockey. I came in and I, I was honest. And I think that's right. something that has really uh, broken through. I don't come on like I'm a know-it-all. I'm not old enough yep. to know it all. I'm not Mike Francesa. Like, I can't right. sit up there and, and act like I'm something I'm not. And I I gave people reality radio. I told them about me. I told them about my life. Very early on, I, I, I told them, you know, I, the day that Kobe passed, nobody on WFAN was talking about, yo, it's been a year since Kobe passed. Or two years, I think. Nobody was talking about that. Or, why, you know, why wasn't that a thing? And I'm like, I guess because these are all older hosts. That, like, right. they didn't watch Kobe come up from 96. I watched hey, Kobe. You're, you're a Jersey guy, so you must have heard he of Lower, Lower Marion, Marion before. He was you in, know? In, uh, in Philly. Like, yep. I, I remember my brother graduated the same year as him. My brother is the same age yep. as him. My brother took me to Madison Square Garden for the first time to see Kobe when I was yep. kind of a free agent with my fandom. Jordan went yep. to the Wizards, so I wasn't going to be a Wizards fan. I right. was a Bulls fan. Yeah, I thought about being a Lakers fan because I love Kobe. But I ended up being a Nets fan because I'm from New Jersey and rooting for the home team, whatever, and didn't want to, yeah. you know, be another bandwagon front. I would be a Yankees, Cowboys, Lakers fan. Everyone would hate me. But, yeah, the, <laughs> the radio, I came into the radio just being right. honest and yep. not being, you know, being vulnerable and not being too, like, too many times these radio hosts – have this bravado and this attitude, like they're smarter than everyone, they know more than everyone, and they're right. Teflon. I came in with reality radio. I choked up on air telling the story of like, you know, this is what Kobe means to me. Like I have the Mamba Mentality book. I always yeah. loved Kobe. Huh. I always loved his work ethic. I always loved right. everything that he put out there to inspire people. My brother is the same age as him, right? My, my brother took me to see Kobe, took me to the garden for the yeah. first time. I'll never forget that. And I lost my brother. And I'm sorry, Keith. 
it crushed me. It changed my yeah. entire world. It changed how I view life. When it changed did, how I how I move. Keith? My when brother pass? passed in 2015 um, oh. when I was 27. So in the midst of all of these things, I was working at MTV. And one of the last things he said to me was, stay at MTV. You'll move up. Because um, <laughs> he was working in the city corporate. And, I mean, yeah. he worked at a couple places, and he didn't move up. Um, and, yeah, when I lost my brother, it rocked my world. And the fact that I was able to speak about that on WFAN – and keep it together. I, I think I gained a lot of fans at that point. I yep. think a lot of people related to that. That mic is powerful. That 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 pierced through. That wasn't a radio yep. host coming in and keeping his private life away from the microphone. That was right. a radio host coming in and saying, like, this is what Kobe means to me. And he's forever linked to my brother. Kobe passed, I think, in January. And my brother's birthday is January 30th. So around that time that Kobe passed... Yep. And I was thinking about my brother. It was heavy. It was hard for me to deal with. And uh, I shared that on air. That mic is powerful. Uh, a lot of people now know of me outside of the internet. And and I, that's that's the next thing, right? Right. I've graduated out of the internet. I'm not bringing the internet <laughs> so much right. to the radio. There are yeah. 60, 70, 80-year-old people that are Keith McPherson fans from WFAN. They don't right. go on Instagram. They don't go on Twitter. So Correct. I can't bring you nerds from Twitter that are trolling me into the radio. I'm done. Right. I, I stopped doing that. I had to learn this year. Good. People would say Good. stupid stupid things in, on Twitter like, oh, Keith McPherson only got this job because he's black. That's the dumbest possible That's way to stupid. look at this because yep. there's been plenty of talented black people in the industry that didn't get opportunities. Correct. Maybe I would have right. got the opportunity sooner if I wasn't a young black man. Yeah. So, like, I remember I brought that to the radio one night, and my boss spoke on it. He's like, man, you're great. He's like, don't bring that right. negativity exactly. from Twitter into the radio. People want to hear you. They want to hear you talk about the game Correct. and the sports. They don't want to hear about these trolls trolling you. And I'm like, you're right. But, like, I use Twitter for information. So as right. I'm reading and, and bringing in information, I'm also deciphering. Like, I'm all, not deciphering. I'm also sifting through these trolls. Yeah. And uh, they don't matter. They don't show their face. They don't show their name. They're trying to you detract. They want that attention. And I'm done. Correct. I had to learn. I am a radio yep. host in New York City. Not too many people get that opportunity. Correct. Not exactly. too many people have their own show. So when I step on my that. show, F what a hater got to say. You guys are stuck yep. online in your parents' basements. Like, I'm the man. And you're throwing rocks. But, like, you'll never, you'll never stop right. me. You'll never reach me. You'll never get here. Do you ever think maybe we need the rocks? We need the obstacles. Absolutely. We need the challenges. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I think so. If it's too easy, if it's handed to you, if you don't struggle, you don't appreciate things, uh, if, if you don't go through something, like, it, it 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 means something to me. Every time I get on that mic, it means something to me. Every time I get on that mic, I'm prepared. Yep. And I know the fraternity and people that came before me at WFA, and I'm right. trying to carry us into the future. Um, I, I, I'm grateful for it. I'm a man of God. I pray. I believe. I have faith. But that is because... When I didn't have the, you know, North Star for me was that God had a plan for me, that there are greater things ahead. God is not putting right. me through all of this for nothing. Keep going. <laughs> Keith, this has been awesome. I, it's been all. Awesome. Maybe I'll give you more tickets. No, I'm kidding. Um, you can give me tickets now. <laughs> now, now I'm credential media. I go wherever I want to go. That's what I'm saying. Place. You go wherever you want. You now, all the me. people that work at the stadium. What's up, Keith? Yo, what's up? Yeah, right. Exactly, dude. I'm. I'm just saying. Right. I. A lot of my good friends work there. None of them have brought me into their booth. Just gonna throw that out there if they're listening today. I will just say throw this. It I would. I would love to bring you up there, but they're hard on me. They have a dress yeah, code on me. I can, I'm ah. barely allowed up there. They see oh, me up there. Yeah, they're yeah. like, who are you? I'm like, I'm Keith McPherson, <laughs> WFAN, MLB Network. They're like, hold on. Let me see your credential. Well, like, yeah, right. Yankee Pull Stadium is Fort Knox. The security yeah, no, and the rules is. that the Yankees have, they literally have their yes. own world in there. They get mad at me. Correct. I can't wear this in the booth. I can't wear this in the media area. You Remarkable, cannot wear right? any logos of any team, including the Yankees. Um, I, I had to conform. I go to the well, stadium. Yeah. I've got a hundred Yankees outfits I could wear. I know. They don't. They at didn't least. want me doing that. At yeah, least. <laughs> at, uh, at they don't least, want you dude. doing that. I've they want it. you to be a neutral media member. And I, I remember telling them, do, right. "Do I come off as neutral? I'm completely biased. Right. I'm here to see the Yankees win." <laughs> <laughs> but it's the visual, right, Keith? It's a visual, man. right? It's There's, a visual. You know, they throw there a camera are people on you. From 
Cleveland here to cover the Guardians. Right. That they can't right. come in here with Chief Wahoo on their hats. <laughs> You're getting trouble anyway. talking about Chief Wahoo, man. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dude, listen. So, um, so you you gotta you gotta get ready for your show tonight. Yeah. So uh, I have a few things I have to do now. It's funny because I just was glancing at my phone. Like I'm yeah. the type of person. Like I wanted to give you a good show, a good you know amount of time oh, to get the full conversation. We're gonna split out these because... up into a couple. Yeah, because this. Yeah, was so I, powerful. I just did a podcast that's coming out this week, and I'm like. You know, there's some things that we missed. Uh, it's a long story to tell, and I don't even yeah. realize at 34, you know, just the 10 years from 24, like, being yeah. out of college. If I go back further like we did to high school, there's even That's more. You, we started from five. We started from fandom. Yeah. So you got I had it. to give you the proper time. I do have a show tonight, but it's not on till late. But uh, I have a show with Sweeney Murdy tomorrow, BXB, nice. Bronx Baseball Podcast that I love that. Texting I, me about, you and Sweeney, I I love Sweeney. It's right? a good dynamic, and, right? We it took yeah, a while dude. to start because they didn't know who to pair me with, and I didn't know who to pair me with. And yeah. I've always respected Sweeney and what he does, and I think we come off great together because I'm yeah. such a fan, and I'm new in the media, and Sweeney is so like, like reporter, been in, right. been doing this for decades, dude. He's, he's measured. I'm not measured at he all. He is measured. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not measured at all. Sweeney will say something, and he'll be like, well, you can't do it. I'm like, I can. I'm, I'm a fan. I can I'm allowed like to. Right? I can say this. I'm yeah. like, you can. Yeah, right, exactly. Oh, my God, that's the best. Oh, you, you've brought, um, you brought joy into um, thousands, if not millions, of fans' lives. And bringing emotion, bringing a commonality, bringing um, a spirit of tribe – together and uniting a lot of people it's a very powerful thing so i want to thank you for bringing a little bit of yourself into our um into our podcast here at murphy's medicine one last thing i guess one last question i have for you is when it goes wrong as it often does we call that murphy's law right and so we have a a medicine, right? It's called Murphy's Medicine. That's the treatment for Murphy's Law. So if you, Keith McPherson, have something that goes wrong, what is your number one anchoring principle for the treatment of when that goes wrong? My, my faith. It's It's gone wrong every year. <laughs> something yeah. has happened that wasn't on the schedule, wasn't anticipated, threw something off, changed my course. My faith. I, I just Your believe. I was, I was baptized in Jacksonville, Florida with my grandmother. My grandmother bought me my first Bible. Uh, I wear a chain around my neck. I don't have it on me now that I bought in Jacksonville. I'm a Christian man. I believe in God. I used to know the Bible better. Um, my faith. That's what I go back to. I have an absolute belief in God's plan for me and my life that it's greater than me, right? You just yep. said I've reached a lot of fans and people. There are a lot of people that have reached out to give me that back to say, Keith, I love your show. I love your story. I, I listen. I follow you. You know, you inspire me. You're my favorite. I didn't know that was going to happen when I was driving Lyft Uber. I didn't know that was going to happen yep. when my brother passed. I didn't know that was going to happen when I was getting arrested all those times and going mm -hmm. through court and paying fines and you know, being in the back of cop cars, like, why am I being mistreated like this? I didn't know. But I kept going because my faith told me I, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I, I don't fear anything because I know God is with me. Like, I know there is a greater plan for my life, my existence, who I am. Um, and, and I have to feel that way when things go wrong, right? You know, the, the worst thing that ever happened to me in my life was losing my brother, who was a father figure for me, who was 10 years older than me. I tell people all the time, like, you know, the success is great, but I don't ever get too big-headed or too cocky or too wild about it because I'm humbled. I'm eternally humbled because there's one person I'll never be able to share these things with. I'll never be able to tell my brother. My brother never heard me on WFAN, and he, he lived in New York, moved to New York, pretended to be a New Yorker. We're from Jersey. We're from the shore. <laughs> But as soon as he yeah. moved to New York, he was a New Yorker, got a New York ID. He would have loved go. to hear WFAN. Hey, this is Keith McPherson. He would have told everybody, turn up the radio. That's my brother. 
I can never share that with him. I can never, yeah. you know, I can never ask him, hey, what do you think of my TV show? So that, that humbles me. And uh, I think God has put that on me to know, like, you know, we're going to lose people and things are going to change. Uh, change is the only constant and it's going to be rough. Right. And I, I also know I've been blessed so much that, like, it's going to balance out. There's going to be some hurt. There's going to be some pain. There's going to be some trying times. But you got to keep going. You're blessed with life. You're alive. You're living. Right. I speak about my brother. My, my brother is in a better place. But, like, his life ended in 2015. He lives vicariously through me. I have to keep going. And I have to keep praying. And I have to keep producing. And I got to keep going for people that believe in me um, and people that don't believe in me, too. I, I got more for haters to be mad at this year. I put that out there last night because I, I, I had to meet some people. <laughs> you know, people people want to pick people want to pick through how someone speaks about DeMar Hamlin. Nobody is prepared to speak about something like that. But people want to nitpick yep. the fact yep. that I, I did the show 1030 to 2 and all we did was Correct. speak on DeMar Hamlin the night that it happened. So then I went on for five hours last night and I said, let me lift your spirits. Please indulge me in other topics. We're going to keep DeMar Hamlin in our prayers and our thoughts, and we're going to speak his name through this program. But we can talk about other things. This is sports is supposed to be an escape. This is supposed to be a distraction. I felt terrible last night into today, and I don't want to feel terrible another night about this. The young man is in the hospital. It's out of our hands. We can speak about other things and people, oh, you're terrible, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, no, you just missed my show last night and that's on you. I don't have time to think about what you think. My boss isn't saying anything to me about it. People are commending me for how I handled the situation both nights. You got it. I have to keep moving forward. That's the only thing you can do. So I want to thank you again, Keith McPherson. Um, listen, you can tune into him on WFAN. You can see him on the television. You can see him on... On YouTube's, uh, he's still on the YouTube's. You find him there. You can see me in We're, real life, Doc. That's can, the thing. Like I'm in Yankee Stadium. Part. I'm in the bleachers. I'm walking around you the concourse. It. I'm in Barclays Center. That's the biggest you thing. I think before I became famous or before I got people are like, I know this guy. I've seen this yeah. guy. He's a regular <laughs> dude. Familiarity is key, and you are, you're a friend, and a mentor, to me, and so I want to thank you for coming on Appreciate the show. You. You bet. You're Listen, the man, and I want to thank everyone else for sticking in. Yankee fandom. <laughs> Listen, dude, um, this is awesome. So I'm I'm going to thank everyone that's listening. I'm going to wrap up with the show. I, I appreciate you, Keith. I, I thank you for being on the show. Um, stick around for a little bit. We'll chat a little bit offline if you have a couple of seconds still. And for everyone else, listen to Murphy's Medicine. When Murphy's Law strikes, there is only one treatment for that diagnosis, and that is Murphy's Medicine. Thanks for staying tuned, and we'll see you next week.